The following presentation of the Eric McKenna Project is sponsored by no one. Hello, you're listening to the Eric McKenna Project. Appreciate it. Back again. Yeah, I always love it. My think, favorite podcast. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. Well, also, it's the one you participate in. Right. A <laughs> um, couple things I want to ask you about today. Uh, in the news right now, would you not agree that the, the Webb telescope is kind of taking up all the space? Oh, when yeah. It comes to co- the cosmos. Yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope um, is very exciting. Very exciting development. Um the fact that it didn't explode on launch um, <laughs> means that NASA is probably still going to get funding in the future, <laughs> which is very exciting. What's the total expenditure so far? Do you, are you aware of that? I believe it's around $20 billion. Um, or no, sorry, $10 billion. Because I know That's it's about cool. 20 times over budget, and I think the budget originally was like $500 million or something like that. Are they behind schedule? Was it initially planned to be launched earlier? Decades ago, yeah. like it probably, Decades ago? Maybe like 15 years ago or something. Yeah, I mean, wow. this thing started being planned in, I think, like 97 or something like that. Um, so. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, there, and there's multiple reasons for that. I mean, one thing that I think everybody needs to always think about whenever they see these things about, you know, 10 years over schedule, like 20 times over budget is like, this isn't like, you know, building a bridge over Forbes Avenue or something like that, right? I mean, it'd be like if you asked me to estimate the cost of a bridge and how long it would take to build. Like, yeah, I'm a scientist. I could probably try and work out like how much steel, how much concrete, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I've never done this before. And so like, it's just my best guess. And whenever you want to send a gigantic tennis court sized infrared observatory into a Lagrange point 15 million kilometers away it you can't re- you could try and estimate that right um, but it's difficult and and one thing that's really different about web versus like Hubble is web is extremely far away right web is like 15 million kilometers away Hubble was like 500 kilometers away kind of still in our orbit right? Right? It's, a, it's an emitter earth orbit yeah, it's yeah. not really that high yeah. so when we sent Hubble up it was broken and we had to go fix it yeah. Um, and we can't do that with web. So, like, that's why, like, you know, they would do all these tests. And if one thing was, like, um, one of my favorite examples is they do the shake test to just see what happens on launch. If they shake it really hard, uh, they put the entire instrument on this giant platform that just shakes. And after the shake, they found one bolt just on the ground. And they had to, like, take the whole thing apart and be like, why did that bolt <laughs> fall out? Where did that come from? So There's no room for error. Exactly. You really can't. Um, you're, you have so much money and time and that people's entire careers have been working on web so yeah it's a, you, we had to be a lot more careful with this one it's also a way more complicated instrument um you know hubble was a single mirror this yeah. thing is these like 16 hexagonal segments that have to like unfold oh, it's so and cool then reposition. Looking. it's so cool it's, looking it's really thing. dope yeah okay so i i want to dive right into that but let's get some context can yeah. you give us the short history let's say the last century of ex- tele- telescope exploration yeah yeah i mean we could go back to the beginning okay and it won't take super long okay um <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, basically for thousands of years, we were just able to look up at the sky, um, and we got pretty far just doing that, right? We were able to figure out all sorts of crazy models of the planets. I mean, the the, the model where the Earth is at the center of the solar system, it is, like, nowadays we see that as, like, kind of archaic and silly. But oh, was that like, Copernicus, or did he Copernicus change that? Copernicus changed it to the okay. sun being in the center, right? Okay. Um, before that, we had the Earth at the center of the solar system, but an interesting factoid is that the model with the Earth in the middle was actually better than Copernicus's model in terms of fitting the data. So we had come up with such an elaborate system of how the planets went around the Earth that it was actually more accurate 
than Copernicus's model. Wow. Um, and the reason is, is because Copernicus didn't know the orbits were ellipses. He thought they were circles. Got it. And so that small shift between like a tiny, you know, that Kepler figured out that it's actually an ellipse, not a circle, that made the difference between the model being correct and not and math. <laughs> and, exactly. <laughs> so anyways, so, we, you know, we're, we, we, we got pretty far. We did pretty good with just our eyes. Um, but it wasn't until the kind of late 1500s, early 1600s when the- That far back. Yeah, yeah. When the Dutch were like figuring out how to grind pretty decent lenses, the optical glass for yeah for for navigation for ships in the 1500s um, that so was started. This was in the early 1500s. Wow. I think something like uh, oh sorry, late 1500s because it was Galileo who first sort of took one of these spyglass things and actually like pointed it at the sky Got it. and started measuring things in the sky. So that was like 1604, 1605, something like that. Okay. Um, and one thing that made Galileo special was one, he was like a classically trained artist being like a Renaissance man, you know, living in Florence and Pisa and stuff. And so whenever he was looking at say like the moon, by looking at the shadows on the moon, he was able to infer a three-dimensional structure because he knew how light kind of blended with three-dimensional sure, objects. Sure, sure. Um, and also, he was a lens maker. He was able to actually make his own lenses for his own purposes. So okay. that kind of gave him a leg up. He made a lot of discoveries, the moons of Jupiter. Um, mm -hmm. There are many moons, but he found the four big ones. Um, the fact that Venus has phases the way that our moon has now, phases. He was finding this out with archaic uh, telescopes. Yeah, telescopes that today, if you had one <laughs> and you like looked up at the sky, you'd be like, how the hell did anybody see anything? <laughs> like, it's literally, you can buy a Galilean telescope for like $5 at like a gift shop. Like, okay. it's crazy. Um, so anyways, fast forward a little bit to Newton. You know, Newton was born the year Galileo died. So he's like the next generation. Newton realizes that you can get the same sort of geometry of, of light rays being focused and magnified using mirrors instead of lenses. They call that um, reflex. That's a reflecting telescope. Yeah. Short aside, when I was a kid, I always wanted these um, real cheap camera lenses that I would see like in magazines for like $79 you got a 400 millimeter but they were the, the concept I was told was it was a mirror lens and oh, it wasn't as optically lens. built it, that that wasn't built as optically you know sound as an actual glass optic lens that's why they were so cheap oh, does that make okay. any sense uh, it does make sense because we're going to get to the okay. price difference and like why James Webb is a reflecting telescope um, so okay so yeah so Isaac Newton builds the reflecting telescope where instead of the light going into a lens and then bending to a focal point it bounces off of this sort of parabolic surface and then bounces off a second mirror and goes into the objective lens that you could look in with your eye. Um, so, okay. th so this creates two different kinds of telescopes that are being developed simultaneously. Telescopes that use refraction, which is when light bends through glass, and telescopes that use reflection, which is when light bounces off of a shiny surface. Um, <clears throat> and they were pretty comparable for a while. I mean, Uranus was discovered by Herschel in the 1700s, and I believe he used a reflecting telescope. Okay. Um, but people are still using refracting telescopes too. Now we're in the 20th century, um, and we're trying to make these things bigger and bigger and bigger, and y it's very difficult to make a refracting lens very big for a few reasons. One, you have to sort of make both sides into a parabola, mm -hmm. and the bigger it is, the costlier it is to do that. I know this from and photography, so, my friend. Yeah, so it's literally just <clears throat> two of them. You have to do it twice. So it's like twice as expensive for that reason. Another reason why it's a problem is because you have to sort of hold it on its edge, right? You can't like support it from underneath like a mirror. And when you hold it on its edge, all of that mass, if this thing is like a meter across, like a meter of glass is very heavy. Mm -hmm. And so if you hold it on its edge, it's going to actually deform slightly, sure, right? Because glass flows sure very slowly and that's going to affect its ability to actually ref uh, get, have a nice focal point. There are other reasons. One has to do with the fact that reflection sends red light at the same angle that it came in from, it sends blue light at the same angle that it came in from, right? The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, just like you're shooting pole. Right. Um, but with refraction, red light bends a different amount than blue light does. And of course it does. That's how a prism works, right? Mm -hmm. the, like the Pink mm -hmm. Floyd album, right? That's mm -hmm. where the rainbow comes from. So what that means is that if you're focusing light with a lens, 
the focal point for red is going to be at a different place than the focal point Got for it. blue. And so that's called chromatic aberration. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get all these different effects that are problem. Light also gets absorbed by the lens, whereas it doesn't get absorbed when it's reflected. So for that reason, all modern day diffraction light. a part of that a part of that discussion. Diffraction is this optical effect that has to do with the um, fact that light is a wave and okay. not just sort of like little balls. I mean, okay. there are times when it makes sense to describe it that way, okay. but the <clears throat> overall form of light as it comes into your instrument is a wave. Is a wave. And because of that, you get these interference effects. Um, so diffraction is literally just the, it just means how waves interact with objects and boundaries they use that that word gets bounced around a lot in photography when you close the shutter down to increase the depth of field but you get to a saturation point where you close it almost too much and then the edges get soft and photographers call that diffraction is that a different explanation nope so what's basically happening there is if the the diameter of the aperture gets really really small Mm -hmm. um then the the time of flight of light from the two sides of the aperture actually starts to become sort of comparable to the to the frequency of okay. the light. And what that means is you start getting these coherent interference effects. Um, and the angular resolution that you can actually resolve um, is inversely proportional to the diameter of your aperture. So it goes so, in the opposite direction. Exactly. Then. Your aperture is really small, then that means you have bad resolution. Your aperture is really big, you have good resolution. And that's essentially why you have to make a telescope big, right? Got it. Um, no matter how smooth your telescope is, no matter how perfect of a parabola it is, no matter how you know long you wait and collect light, the fact that light is not just like a ray that comes in like a laser beam, it mm-hmm. actually is a wave that comes in, you are diffraction limited is what it's called by the, the size Does the, the telescope. telescope also have an aperture? It, in or a sense, it does. Is that a function of camera? Is that a function of photography? No, in a sense, it does, and the aperture is the shape of the telescope, okay. right? So just like how okay. you know, you're letting in a circle of light through the aperture of a camera, you're sort of capturing a circle of light from the actual surface of the telescope. Okay. And so that's the effective aperture okay. of that optical system. Sorry to mean to get yeah. you off. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Okay. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, so you need a reflecting telescopes are much cheaper, they're much easier to build. Um, and so less glass. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, I mean, you don't need any glass per se, because yeah, you can use anything that is able to reflect light in some sort of coherent way. Okay. Um, how do thus you, the mirrors, thus the mirrors, right? Um, how do you, have to how do you do that you have to basically make this thing smooth on the order of the wavelength of the light so what mm-hmm. that means is that if light has a wavelength that's just a hundred few hundred nanometers you can't have any bumps that are bigger than a few hundred it's nanometers distorted. so exactly yeah so that's what makes you know these there's uh <laughs> this uh, description I heard one time of the James Webb Space Telescope mirrors that if you blew up the mirror to be the size of a continent then the largest bump would be like ankle high. Wow. Just to like have a kind of visual you mean from a tolerance of how smooth. You saying from a tolerance level? Exactly. Just how smooth that surface is. Um, so, and yeah, that's what you need to do in order to make sure that like you don't get any sort of like effects of light refracting off corners. When you see Hubble, uh, the famous picture of him on like this step ladder and then staring into this, is that is that apparatus that telescope? Is that an optical only lens or is there a mirror in there too like what is he looking at in that picture that's a very famous picture yeah so, i don't he may have been using a refracting telescope which then? means one with the lens yeah yeah okay. no i mean like the university of pittsburgh has um an observatory up in the north hills right and they have a actual gigantic refracting telescope on like a floor that sort of lowers um and that thing was i don't know when it was built but it was probably built within the last like 50 years and so oh, okay people still used refracting telescopes okay um but what i mean is like if since like I don't know, like 1980 or something. Like there hasn't been any like big refracting telescopes made. Is that when the change went to being infrared or not infrared? Yeah, uh, we're using infrared now, right? So yeah, the electromagnetic yeah, spectrum. Yeah, that's what I mean. Right. Yeah. Um, is uh, you have to reconstruct the photograph from the data. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's true. Um, the in- the electromagnetic spectrum, different parts of the spectrum. So when I say infrared uh, electromagnetic spectrum, right, light is an electromagnetic wave. Right. Um, 
and the wavelength of that wave actually dictates what kind of phenomena you're looking at basically okay. so um, it's not that we use infrared now because it's like a superior kind of light it's because the phenomena we're interested in the light when it gets to us is infrared Got it. so we still have x-ray telescopes we still have gamma ray telescopes we still have optical telescopes because different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum correspond to different kinds of events in the universe um, and also corresponds to different times in the universe and we could kind of get back okay. to that in a moment um, but yeah so NASA has a whole suite in the ESA in Europe they have a whole suite of different projects that are looking at all different parts of the spectrum from all because are there you any need all that information. Op- are there any optical only telescopes or what's I guess I should say what is to your knowledge one of the largest if not the largest optical only telescope and is it still being used? So optical is a word that we use to just describe the you know bending and manipulation of electromagnetic like waves. Glassed. Do you mean visible light or do you mean refract? Do you mean refracting uh, telescope? Are there any telescopes being used in science today that when you look through them, a novice like I could look in there and I'm actually seeing the output? Gotcha. I don't, it doesn't have to be reconstructed or. Yeah. So one that both is a vis- a visible spectrum instrument and also has an eyepiece. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Of some kind. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But what's the largest? And how? How? If I was at the most powerful one made, how far could I just see? Look in it. Actually, see. <sighs> how far? That's an interesting question. Um, because it kind of depends on like the um, brightness of the thing you're looking at. Okay. Like, w- like we. Hmm. Like power wise, magnification wise, do any idea? Right, magnification wise, I'm not actually sure. That's a good question. Um, the cost had to be. It probably would be cost prohibitive now to mess with glass of that size and that caliber, right? I mean, there's got to be a limit at some point, right? Functional limit. Well, I mean, I think probably the way to talk about magnification would be, you know, what is the smallest angular resolution of your vision? versus the smallest angular resolution of the instrument. So what I mean by okay. angular resolution, is okay. let's say you take <laughs> two dots on a piece of paper, draw a little dot left, a little dot to the right, and I hold it up and you could see that it's two dots. At what point do I back up so far that you can't distinguish those two dots, right? That's called your angular resolution. Okay. So whenever I stop because you can't distinguish it, if you take a protractor and you point at the left dot and you point at the right dot, that makes an angle, and that angle is like your angular resolution. When they merge. Right. Your humans are roughly, if you've like 20-20 vision, is something like an arc minute, which is like 1 60th of a degree. Okay. So a degree is one three hundred sixtieth of a circle. One sixtieth of a degree is an arc minute. Your thumb is about thirty um, arc minutes across. So if you just kind of take a marker and draw thirty lines next to each other on mm-hmm. your thumb, and you kind of hold it out at arm's length, that should be a rough estimate of your angular resolution. So the best um, optical, like visual photon um, telescopes probably are something like milli arc seconds okay Okay, so what is that okay an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute makes sense 60 seconds in a minute right and a milli arc second is a thousandth of an arc second so it's basically so then the magnification would be like 60,000 times because you have to go a thousand. Wow. And so what a, a kind of way to think about that is if it pointed at the moon, it w- could probably like see a school bus or something like that, right? So something that's on the order of like a few meters on the moon. Um, okay. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's extremely um, impressive. It, it, yeah. Now we're, we're talking about, we're talking about, could it pre- we're talking about in theory could you do what you just said but I think we talked prior that it was to actually for us to get something and look and find that footprint of the Armstrong footprint. we were figuring like it wasn't really yeah. that easy because like, sure, applying the actual practicality of doing it's different right yeah well I mean a school bus is also considerably larger so what I mean by that is a school bus is like a single pixel got it so a footprint is another you know order of magnitude smaller than that right and then there's also just sort of like 
magnification is one thing, but there's also just like brightness and contrast and like how, you know, how many photons are you actually collecting? How much light are you collecting? And so that's another reason why you need a big telescope. One is for angular resolution, but one is because we are looking at events that are so faint that we have to do a long exposure photograph for like right. hours right. <laughs> to like collect right, right. three photons or something <laughs> like that, right? Um, I have a friend who uh, works at the Perimeter Institute, which is like this fancy theoretical physics um, research institute in Canada. Okay, um, and he is modeling gamma ray bursts, these like stellar explosions. Okay, um, and in, in space, uh, he models them using. Um, he's like a numerical general relativity guy so he, okay. he like simulates einstein's equations on a on a computer um and also just like fluids flowing relativistically and stuff like that and he literally like is trying to fit this data that is like five photons <laughs> like we got five, five photons, photons. <laughs> so you know just to give you an idea like you know the light coming off of this in any millisecond is shining maybe something like 10 to the 20 photons or something crazy like that five um, photons yeah. so you know we have to like infer a lot of physics from a very small amount of data if that were 10 photons it'd be so much easier <laughs> and so like you the bit the size of the telescope is really important for that i got you off your game i apologize i, no, I no, took you in all these different directions um, but yeah so um eventually we kind of come around to the fact that reflecting telescopes are going to be the best um is this early 20s so yeah i would say probably by the time you know, early 20s, there were still a kind of mix of reflecting and refracting telescopes. Okay. Um, but, yeah, once once we start getting into the second half of the 20th century, it's pretty much all reflecting from there. Okay. Um, and we usually, we don't, like, put them in random places. Like, we used to have observatories next to cities and stuff like that. Nowadays, if you're going to build an instrument... Um, Chile. Yeah. <laughs> you need basically it to be extremely high up because uh, the atmosphere is a pain. Peru. Uh, it should be very dry. Yeah. Right. So, like, one of the biggest observatories is in northern Chile at the European Southern Observatory, and it has just, like, a dozen really impressive telescopes from a bunch of different countries there. Um, the United what a job. Yeah, that'd be it's awesome. Yeah. That'd be really cool. <laughs> um, the United States' big observatory is in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So basically, okay. you're on a volcano 14,000 <laughs> feet up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's about as good as you're going to get, right? That was a risky um, build. So, yeah, <clears throat> well, I think it's a dormant one, hopefully. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so so that so that's, that's where all of the most advanced okay. um, telescopes are nowadays. Um, the U.S. has also has or NASA has an observatory in Chile as well. Um, and that's where like the um, giant Magellan telescope is being built, which is just like this humongous. What is that? Uh, I, that I've not heard of. Giant, so there is a new class of telescopes being built on Earth right now that are um, called extremely large telescopes because <laughs> they're very creative. Um, and, and the giant Magellan telescope is one. There's one literally called the ELT, the okay. extremely large <clears throat> telescope. Um, and uh, it's that's being built in, in Chile as well. Um, the U.S. was going to build the 30 meter telescope. Okay. Um, in Hawaii. <coughs> uh, sorry, I forgot sorry. to take my allergy medicine. No worries. <laughs> um, was going to build the 30 meter telescope in Hawaii, but there was a bit of just like political issues with um, the indigenous populations there, okay. and also just Hawaiians, because Mauna Kea is one of the best places on earth for doing astronomy but it's also like a very sacred place mm -hmm. for the native people of hawaii um and i think that when we especially when we first started doing things up there it was just not done well with like there were no so i don't think there's any conversations with right. the elders and things now they're trying to like walk that back and repair that relationship and try and sort that out but if we can't come to a decent agreement right. then we might have to put it somewhere else um but anyways these are telescopes 30 meter telescopes that's like 100 feet right <laughs> um in diameter um and so it'll 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 look similar to the web in that it'll right. be made of a bunch of Panels. hexagons 
polygons that are sort of tiled. easier to work on though yeah <laughs> there's no way we we don't have the technology that could make a parabola that size out of out of like metal or glass or something so you have to make these little things and luckily our computers are so good our actuators are so good that we can reconstruct this sort of like parabolic shape out of these hexagons um in a way that we never would have been able to do before um now we have can we make it even could this terrestrial based telescope be even bigger and more powerful than the web the web has the advantage of positioning though right Yes. So for some things, it could be better than Webb, like in terms of the fact that it's looking at visible light, which Webb is not doing. Um, and it also will have resolutions that are comparable, if not better than Webb. Um, but there's just something that n you cannot do on Earth, and that is to look at these really stretched out infrared wavelengths. And the reason is, is because everything in this room including this table which you know feels cold to my hand mm -hmm. is still a bright light bulb in the infrared spectrum right that's why night vision goggles work because all they do is they port they give you the infrared image right. and everything is a light bulb in infrared and so you just can't do very good infrared um telescope like from earth from earth they're just too like the earth is the sun in infrared in a sense like it is just a giant bright source and so you just need to get the heck away from it and you need to block all of the light coming from the earth in order to see things um in that spectrum and so nothing will we have a follow-up for web too there's another like version of web that's in the planning now that's like way bigger than web um and just like the original james webb space telescope it's based off of technology that doesn't exist yet so they're like trying to estimate how long it'll take and so that's you know, so when web the design for web started the technology did not exist to totally. actually get it up there yeah these like big i mean maybe the rockets existed but like parts of the instrument they just assumed would exist at some point like that that's the way a lot of this big science is done you like have to be the, yeah like the large hadron collider Same and like thing. these things they're just like okay and then in 2020 we'll replace the magnets with these other magnets in order to get this and it's just like what are those made of and it's just like i don't know 2020 like it's going to exist by then. don't worry about it um and so that's yeah that's another thing that kind of needs to be taken into consideration it's not just like we're building a bridge where we know the uh, there's unknown unknowns right okay <laughs> with any of these big science things that uh um and also another thing i think that's important uh, about web is that remember it was being developed in like the early 2000s and we went from like desktop win like windows xp to like iPhone 12 Pros in like that amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's also a sort of cost associated with, well, if we just wait another year, literally we'll get twice as much like computational Technology. power. There's, so you have to at some point make a call and be like, this is enough. Um, but so that's pretty relevant too. Yeah, and that's, that, like, they're working with it, then a year later, it's like, damn it, look what's available yeah, now. Yeah, it's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean. So the it, Hubble, talk about Hubble. Um, that the development of that when it was launched and the discovery and then and what they're expecting out of web is supposed to be so much better yeah so um hubble was a pretty what's called a broad spectrum instrument which means it's looking at electromagnetic wiggles that what are, year did that go in? uh i want to say like 1990 maybe yeah i thought it was the like late 80s or yeah, something something like that yeah i mean it was launched up by the shuttle program which is late 80s right. so um yeah. And it's just in our orbit. Yeah, so it's close to Earth. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Can we see it? Um, when it passes over, is it visible? I, we on the ground can't see it, no. I mean, like the International Space Station, can you can that. actually see, which is pretty cool. But yeah. I don't think Hubble's solar panels are big enough. I mean, maybe if you actually knew where you were looking, okay. and it was really good, you're in Mauna Kea or like Chile okay. or something, but okay. I'd, I'd be surprised if you could see that. I've seen the International Space Station from Wilkinsburg. <laughs> you could see that thing sometimes. Um, okay, so, yeah, I mean, if you looked at Earth, Hubble would be, like, right there, right? Like, Earth is 6,000 kilometers in radius, and okay. Hubble is only half a thousand kilometers like you know like 500 kilometers right. up so hubble is very close to to the um earth and uh that thing was launched yeah in the early 90s um and an another reason why web took so long and what makes web very different than hubble is that 
you don't get any chance to service the James Webb Space Telescope, right? We, we um, serviced Hubble. When Hubble first launched, there was the the mirror surface was defected, and they actually had to send human beings up there, astronauts, to go up and put a corrective plate onto the surface of the mirror um, in order to actually make this a useful I saw instrument. a documentary on repairing that. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. That's very cool. Yeah, that would have been awesome to, to be a part of that mission. Um, but yeah, so... And that's because it's like, you know, just 500 kilometers up. The James Webb Space Telescope is at this special point, and we could kind of talk about what yeah. these mean, these Lagrange points. Yeah, right. we have prior that blew my mind, so yeah. try, try it again. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. we could definitely go for that one more time. Uh, these Lagrange points, um, and this Lagrange point that it's at is like, it's like 10% of the distance between here and the sun, which is 150 million kilometers, so it's like 15 million kilometers away. So it's out there. Um, so it's very, it's, we're not going there, right? And, and um and that's why also it's going to be going to be a limited mission. Like Hubble, in principle, you know, can last very, very, very long because it doesn't really need anything. The there's cryogenics on board of Webb that are going to run out if anything happens to it. We oh, I didn't can't know that. So it's it. got a shelf life. It has a total shelf life. Yeah, I mean, like, give me an estimate. What are they talking about? <clears throat> I think the original plan was something like ten years or something like that. Um, but it was contingent on how efficient the launch was because okay. it was like just however much fuel we have left when we get up there because um, <laughs> the Lagrange point that it's at is not like a stable point like the bottom of a hill it's an unstable point like the top of a hill so it has to like maneuver in order to stay in its orbit um, the European Space Agency did an amazing job and had an incredibly efficient launch and so it actually they think it might last like 20 years okay. which would be pretty cool but um, it'll be obsolete in 10 years don't you think based upon other technology or maybe not yeah, I mean, it's there are definitely going to be components of it that are obsolete, but I don't think there's going to be another like infrared telescope that is going to be as impressive as you know. You mean launched it in twenty years? Exactly. What you're yeah. Saying. yeah, I mean, I, in about twenty years, we might have the updated James Webb ready. Um, we'll see. We'll see if China really gets into science as they mm-hmm. sort of develop because they're able to just deploy state resources in a way that's pretty impressive. Um, you know, for better or for worse. You right. know, we don't need to go there, but right. Um, yeah, so the James Webb Space Telescope needs to be at one of these Lagrange points. Um, what is the Lagrange point? Yeah. I'll just give just like a brief thing. So the Earth is going around. It's not this. related to ZZ Top, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that Lagrange? Is Lagrange. Lagrange. <laughs> Lagrange, Lagrange. Oh, got you. Um, so the Earth is going around the sun. Um, and if you sort of looked in a reference frame where the earth and the sun were fixed okay that would be what's called a rotating reference frame so if you're sitting on a merry-go-round you feel like you're just sitting there at rest but the whole thing is rotating right Mm -hmm. so me and you are on a merry-go-round we're at rest with respect to each other that's a rotating reference frame and what you might know is when you're in a rotating reference frame physics acts weird if you're sitting in a merry-go-round and you take a marble and you just set it on the ground the marble starts to go like radially away from you. Right. Like it, it rolls off the merry-go-round. Right. And, there, and, you, and you might say like, what force pushed it off the merry-go-round? And the answer is no force. It just wanted to keep going tangent, but the merry-go-round was sort of rotating underneath it. So this, if you've ever been on a roller coaster and you go around a curve, you feel that like push against the side of the roller coaster. Got it. <coughs> Bless you. My apologies. No worries. Um, and, uh, Nothing is pushing you against the wall. It's that the wall, the edge of the roller coaster is kind of going into you as you try and just go Got tangent it. to the curve. Got it. So anyways, if you go into a reference frame where the earth and the sun are at rest, there are three forces. There's the sun that's pulling you inwards, the earth pulling you towards the earth, and then there's this weird centrifugal force that's kind of making you want to go radially away from the sun. Those three forces are able to balance each other. Okay. So that there's no net force. Okay. So that if you put a pebble there, it would stay there forever. Got right? it. Those, there are five points where that happens. And those five points are called Lagrange points. Okay. These are these five points where the centrifugal outwards and the sun and the earth inwards balance. So there are three of them that are just in line with the sun and the earth. You could be in between the sun and the earth and be pulled the same way both ways. You could be all the way out where the sun and the earth are both pulling you in, but the centrifugal force is pulling you out. Okay. You could be on the other side of the earth where the sun and the earth are pulling you in, but the centrifugal force. Okay. And there's two, two other ones that make an equilateral triangle with the earth and the sun. Okay. So this is L1 
in between the Earth and the Sun, L2 on the other side of the Earth, L3 all the way on the other side of the Sun, okay. and then L4 and 5 are these ones in, that make the equilateral triangle. L4 and L5 are really interesting because they are stable. Uh, sorry, they're equilibrium points and they're stable. Okay. So the difference between stable and not stable is like, you know, if you put a rock on the side of a hill, then it's going to roll down. That's not an equilibrium point. Right. If you put a rock on the very top of a hill, it won't roll down. Mm -hmm. So it is an equilibrium mm -hmm. point. But if you tap it in any direction, then it flies okay. away. So that's unstable. The bottom of a hill, it won't move if you put it there. But if you tap it, it also just kind of oscillates about that point. L4 and L5 are stable. And so we have instruments there that are, you know, looking at things and, and, and it's a really great place to put instruments because you don't really need fuel. They'll just kind of like hover around there. Got it. L1 is good because it's in between us and the sun. And so we have solar observatories that are just staring at the sun at L1. L3 is useless. It's on the other side of the sun. All right. L2 is useful because if you were to sort of put a sunshade on the bottom of your spacecraft, you could block both the earth and the sun and because you're co-moving with the earth and the sun you won't have to change your orientation and at is all. that what the theory of webb that's what james webb is okay. doing okay right so james okay. webb is at l2 because it needs to block <clears throat> both the earth okay. and the sun and that and explains it the crazy temperature differentiation between what's exposed to the sun and on the back side of it right, right? yeah so let's talk about like the technical okay. uh, aspects of james webb so okay. james webb needs to be colder than space like it needs to be just like a fraction of a degree um, above absolute zero um, yet space is actually super hot like you th people think of space as being really cold, cold because dark, there's no right. like atmosphere but like if you think about how hot a desert is why is it hot because the sun is beating down on you the 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 um, atmosphere is very thin the surface is right? eating up right so exactly space is like a desert right where the sun is just hitting you and there's no atmosphere or anything and so that's why like the surface of the moon is like boiling hot during the day right i didn't know that yeah it's like the astronauts um shoes have to be like thick <laughs> because the surface is very hot wow um and it's because it's like a desert the sun is beating down on when it you say constantly. boiling like if, if if you could breathe if there's if, if you could breathe in the moon you went out of your suit is it boiling like it would melt you Okay, so if there were an atmosphere, then it would not because the atmosphere would would um, equilibrate the temperature on the front like side and the back side. Yes. Okay. The okay. back side of the moon is freezing, <laughs> right? It's like colder than the coldest point on Earth. Got it. And so this would actually make it... That's why the Earth is kind of nice <laughs> because it's sort of in between boiling and freezing, Got it. right? Got um, it. So, Livable. Yeah, exactly. Um habitable as they call yeah, it yeah habitable. <laughs> habitable zone we're the goldilocks zone. exactly goldilocks <laughs> planet um okay so um james webb has to be extremely cold so the way it does it is it has these five incredibly thin sheets um i forget the name of this material um it's like capped on or something like that it's like super thin polymer that they stretch out to about the size of a tennis court oh a and, tennis court yeah and it blocks uh, the radiation from this side, and they have five of them stacked in parallel. So what happens is the first one like gets hit by all this light, all this radiation, and it's super reflective, so most of it, it bounces off, but some of it heats up that sheet. Okay. So that sheet radiates energy this way. It also radiates energy this way, right. which is why they have another sheet. And they're tilted so that when it radiates onto the sheet, it sort of bounces in between them and then goes away. This one will slowly heat up, so then they have another sheet. And if you do this five times, you can create a temperature differential that goes from like 250 degrees Fahrenheit on one side to like a few degrees above absolute zero on wow. the other side. And this is like six inches, by the way, between these five things. So it's, yeah, that's mind numbing. It's totally crazy, yeah. Um, again, never been done before. We had to just guess that this would <laughs> the, work the math, like the math worked <laughs> exactly so like another reason why they had to test it and all these crazy ways <clears throat> is very expensive um so that that keeps the the device cold and then they also have like a cryogenic thing on on board to get it even colder right um so the sunshade is just to make the job of the cryogenic thing like a little bit easier okay so that's um, called the sunshade the sunshade is the thing that's blocky at that crazy okay, but, that, but that's board. not the lens though right that's not the mirrors right okay. so that's the giant sunshade and then on that is a telescope 
right? Okay. Um, and so the lens is sort of facing like this, and the sunshade is sort of like this. Protecting um, it. Protecting it. Now, what is the mirror surface? It's basically these 16 hexagons. Um, they unfold to be something like six meters across. And it's that like was the big feet. thing, right? Was the was the unfolding of the mirrors? Right. So this thing is so big, it's like the size of a house. And so, like, you can't just launch it into space. They needed to make an origami infrared space telescope, right? What the that hell was is that? able to like fold up and oh, the sunshade had yeah. fold up. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, you know, that that was the biggest concern of the whole mission was that, you know, when you unfold a mirror Mirrors are deterministic in a sense that you know how it's going to unfold, and so you can make sure that it does it correctly. Fabric folds and unfolds non-deterministically um, in the sense that if you kind of take a sheet and I take two sides and I push it together, there's like no math that uniform. is capable right. of figuring out. If I do this a trillion times, a trillion it will different. fold slightly differently yeah. all trillion times. Yeah. So like they had to be super careful the way they packaged it up so that when it pulled across, this is like a fraction of a millimeter, the thickness of this thing, and they're pulling it out to the size of a tennis court. If it snags or anything, or there's too much tension in one place, then that's t 20 years, $20 billion down the train, right? $10 billion. So, so there was no room for air anywhere no. in this project. Yeah, this thing, they had to like make a giant vacuum chamber and like fold it, unfold it a million different ways and try and like figure out how it was going to react. It's also like, you know, hurling through space <laughs> and there's like cosmic rays. So there's a lot of like things that are, that make this very difficult. So the mirror is super impressive. It's this like, you know, 20 feet or so uh, tessellation of hexagons. The hexagons are made out of beryllium, okay. um, which is, it's very brittle, but it also is an extre is extremely resilient to temperature fluctuations, which, you know, if you go from 200 degrees to like a fraction, you need to make sure that the shape doesn't deform because of, of temperature fluctuations. Um, it's also quite resilient to micrometeorite impacts. So like meteorites. Like so so <laughs> let's, let's ask about that because I always wondered about that. Like the, you can't plan for objects hurling through space to just randomly hit your stuff <laughs> yeah no um, i mean like we are luckily at this point in our civilization we're pretty good at knowing like where anything that's like a decent size would be um so we're actually not really worried about something like the size of this lava lamp hitting our spacecraft um but there are just like things the size of bacteria moving 20,000 miles an hour relative to this telescope that are like flying through space. Um, and so we have to make sure that when those things inevitably hit the craft, you know, it will mess up, you know, a few bits and RAM and stuff like that, but we have to make sure it doesn't like affect the optics too much. And so the, okay. the beryllium is pretty stable against that. And it also has a coating on top of it. That's very stable against that. Now, Beryllium is not very good at reflecting infrared light, which okay. is what we're trying to capture. So they had to coat the surface. Of course they did. And <laughs> a, yeah, a non-corrosive material that's really good at reflecting infrared light. And so that's why it, they look gold, because yeah. they literally are just coated in gold. Um, and a lot of people see the $10 billion price tag, and they see a house-sized piece of gold, and they're like, no wonder it's so expensive. <laughs> It, my ring has more gold in it than the entire James Webb Space Telescope. Like, Understood. Like, it's not a lot of gold. It's, like, maybe a few nanometers of gold. Uh, across, but it's enough that it creates this, like, brilliant surface, a reflecting surface, which is pretty awesome. Um, okay. So, have these gold-coated beryllium folding mirrors. <clears throat> and each of these mirrors has actuators that can move just like you know dozens of atoms thick so uh, dozens of atoms deep so that it can kind of rearrange itself and that's what it's doing right now is it's it's in space it's at the lagrange point the sun shades are unfolded it's getting to temperature it's calibrating itself it's calibrating itself by basically looking at a star and then it's moving one th mirror at a time until that was that the star. first pictures that showed up right that was part of the calibration process. that was all calibration yeah we're not going to get like an actual james webb picture until like the summer at some point okay um, which is gonna be cool um okay so this sounds like a lot why don't we just build it in hawaii why do we want infrared right that's kind of the question the point of james webb <clears throat> is that it's not just trying to get really high magnification images or something like that. We can get that on Earth. What it's trying to do is it's trying to look at light that was emitted 
just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So like very early in the history of the universe. The universe is 15 billion years old, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So this light might have been emitted in the X-ray or the visible or something like that, where the wavelengths are really short. However, the universe has been expanding for the last, you know, 14 and a half right. billion years. And what does that expansion do to light? It causes the wavelengths to get longer. Yep. And eventually blue becomes red becomes infrared and so if you kind of calculate what would a galaxy look like that was you know one of the first galaxies ever in the history of the universe the answer you do the calculation and be like oh yeah it'd be like deep in the infrared and so that's what james webb is doing is it's trying to look at the first galaxies that formed um which will kind of tell us about the distribution of matter and energy right after the Big Bang. It'll tell us a lot about the subsequent evolution of our universe. How do they know it's going to look for <clears throat> light originating at that time frame? Why not all the way back to the... What is the what is the reason we can't get data from the inception, from the singularity, from or, or from right next to that? So if, like like a, a human minute after the singularity. What's stopping us? Okay, so... <clears throat> The universe used to be very hot and very dense. So right now it is very not dense and it is quite cool in the middle. Right. Like, you know, we're close to a, a giant star called the sun, but if we but were, we're still in expanding. It, it, so it's still, it's still cooling. It's still getting like okay. less and less dense now, okay. but back in time it was contracting. If you kind of work the video backwards where it was hot and dense, um, things that get hot enough and dense enough are not transparent. For example, the sun is a hot, dense plasma, and you can't see on the other side of the sun. Okay. Right? So what that means is like, you know, when you think about like light that was emitted a long time ago, it basically had to travel through space in order to get to our eyes. You can only look back to the point in time where the universe wasn't transparent. And we can see okay. we can see that whole surface okay. in every direction around us. We can see where the universe stopped being transparent. Okay. This is called the cosmic microwave background. background. It's so stretched out that it's in the microwave spectrum. It's not even infrared. Got it's it. in the microwave. Oh, that, that put it together. And for we me. can use microwaves to look at that. Um, but that's the best we're ever going to be able to do with light. We can look at correlations in the temperature fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background to try to infer well, we have yeah right, we have right. right to try and infer things before that right the correlations match up with this theory of inflation pretty well that seem to be sort of quantum in nature mm -hmm. and so we're kind of trying to learn about quantum gravity from this um, but nonetheless that's the best you could do with light you need something that penetrates a hot dense plasma if you want to see before that and that's one of the reasons why gravitational waves are are so exciting because there are positive and negative charged electric particles that can screen and block electric fields. Got it. There's no positive and negative mass that could block a gravitational wave. Got it. Right. So um, that might be the key to look back to the singularity. Yeah. If you want to see what's going on, um, you know, right after the Big Bang, you know, we pretty theoretically we think we have a pretty good grasp on it up until like you know maybe like. <laughs> 10 to the 10th of a second or something like that. So, you <laughs> we know. just don't know the cause of it. Yeah, I mean, if you we run... Have theories, we, we have theories. <throat> we have theories, yeah. But our theory does not make predictions if you go far enough back. What okay. that means is that our theory... The math is, breaks down. Exactly, yeah. Our theory is kind of like this really fancy approximation. And we know it's an approximation now. We know that it cannot be the full theory because it literally just gives nonsense if you try and take it too far back like it just you divide by zero basically um so so that's why it'd be really nice to see back there because we have a lot of ideas of what actually happens like what kind of resolves this like tiny moment in both space and time um however we don't have any experiment uh, experimental evidence that can guide us in our theory making and so that's what's gonna be frustrating fun. itself for people like you <laughs> yeah yeah no, definitely i mean so <clears throat> theoretical <clears throat> physics i think is like making it really interesting progress in a lot of interesting directions but it is a very different kind of progress than was being made in like the 60s and 70s when a new particle is being discovered like every like six months or something like you know 
before it was like we have all this data coming from all these different directions how do we make sense of all of it and now it's like we've created this amazingly interesting mathematical landscape Mm -hmm. that creates all these different kinds of universes and all these different kinds of phenomena and like how does any of this connect to like what it would be like to live in this universe 15 billion years after some kind of big bang because we got to like somehow make some inferences based off of our experience Mm -hmm. um also what helps with science is having multiple experiments right but the universe only happened one time to us (laughs) so we we kind of have an n equals one data set that we're trying to infer all of this stuff from right um so that makes it hard like when we learn things about stars we do it by basically looking at trillions of stars and then doing some statistical analysis we can't look at trillions of universes and do right. a statistical analysis what so the public what is the public going to see different your guesstimate when, when this thing gets fired up in the summertime like what are the images are they because uh hubble gave us the one of the most famous photographs of its life i believe which is the three clusters of um oh I don't know, there are galaxies, which is like the three columns. Yeah, the, of, the fingers of God or whatever those. Uh, I don't, I don't know, but that, that was, I think that's probably, what, if, you, if you ask the average person, they know what Hubble is, and they say, oh, it's that one photograph with those, you know. What, what are we going to get for our tax money? <laughs> no, I mean, that's a very legit question. You guys paid a lot of money for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, I would say the primary thing being real is that, like, we're going to get understanding about a period of time that we just have literally no data from um and so the images look vastly different uh i don't think so i mean we're going because i mean because here's the thing like even those like fingers or whatever from um the hubble those weren't just like optical images that was a basically a rendering of the data from the right. from the ccd on the the telescope that color was added to in order to see contrast right um and so th- there are still going to be images like that from the jwst the james Webb space telescope there's going to be there you won't actually it won't be a real image in the sense that it's infrared and our right. eyes don't see in the infrared right so they'll have to correlate they'll say okay you know 1200 nanometer infrared we'll call green Mm -hmm. 2000 nanometer Mm -hmm. red we'll call Mm -hmm. orange and then whenever you look at the image through that they'll pick colors that look the nicest they'll pick colors that give the best contrast but it's not going to be a sort of like new like kind of galaxy that yeah it it maybe could be but i don't know of any laws of physics that would say that well all your alien enthusiasts somehow are they're totally out of their minds with they they, of this theory they believe this thing's going to see back further and further distance and and they're going to see like spaceships flying around and stuff like that yeah there's a there's a conventional wisdom out there that some people believe that yeah i think that's (laughs) unlikely um and the reason is is because i think that the most likely time for there to be spaceships are today right Right. because not back then exactly like that's the least likely place we could look into the future maybe if you look into the future right yeah i mean like the shorter you look the more likely i think you are to find that sort of thing um because this is going to be before stars have like made copper and like iron and stuff like that this is back whenever it was hydrogen and helium and the first clusters of hydrogen was coming together to make helium and the it still has to be fascinating so, to think what are you going to see well i mean what are those images going to look like yeah i think they're gonna look probably like galaxies like galaxy images because it's too far to see individual stars or anything like that so we'll probably see I think what would be kind of cool is if we kind of saw early galaxies being formed from giant dust clouds or something like that. Okay. That'd be kind of sweet. Okay. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think NASA does a pretty good job at trying to make cool stuff for the public, and I think they're going to do a good job at this, partially because they need to convince us. They got to sell it. They got to sell it, yeah. Um, and, And... but like, I think that the science is going to be extremely valuable. If you believe in this sort of mission of humans to try and understand their universe, this is an incredibly important piece of information. So whether the pictures are more pretty or less pretty than some other instrument, they'll do their best. And like, we've got like a lot better technology yeah. now to make better yeah. images. But um, uh, the most important thing is that 
you know, it's literally like, what if you could look through a telescope on earth and see like the pyramids being built, right? Like that would be really awesome. Like it wouldn't look any crazier than any other sort of like stone thing being built now, but it would be a very important thing. Certainly. To, like, you know, understand like what happened in Certainly. the past. And so quick question about the galaxy and the photographs of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So for decades, we've seen photographs of the Milky Way galaxy. Is it more of an artist rendering or is, do we actually have photographs of the Milky Way? Because we're in the Milky Way. Right. So how, who's taken that photo exactly. of us sitting in the Milky Way yeah. spiral galaxy? It's completely made up. We've never taken a picture of the Milky Way. <laughs> uh, the Milky Way galaxy. I think there's a misconception <laughs> there, there is, man. Yeah. I mean, if you go to like Wikipedia, like it kind of like shows you a galaxy, but it, what if you, but if you look at it carefully, it's probably like, Andromeda, or Andromeda, M eighty seven. Like this is a spiral galaxy, just like the Milky Way, or something like that. Right? So we don't have a so, photograph of R. Absolutely not. No, um, we know <laughs> um, we've mapped out a significant fraction of the Milky Way, and so we can reconstruct the sort of relative location of where stars and we're and just, are. We're just but, like so in some random spot in the Milky Way. We're just kind of there. Yeah. I mean, the thing to keep in mind <laughs> is the Milky Way galaxy. The center of anything. Yeah, it's a hundred thousand <clears throat> light years across. Right. So it would take us like a hundred thousand years to get to a point where we could take a picture of the whole Milky Way going the speed of light, right? And which we can't do at the moment. So like there's no way we're ever gonna get a picture of the Milky Way unless like we use No, that wouldn't even be feasible. I was just thinking like, is there any way you know, because light bends, like, could we use, like, gravitational lensing to see an image of the Milky Way from around another object? Or, like, could we reconstruct a reflection of the Milky Way from, like, a dust cloud of a nearby galaxy or something? Like, for example, you can look at the dark side of the moon, and if you have a good enough instrument and you have a good enough ability to do computer science, okay. you can reconstruct a decent picture of the Earth from the dark side of the moon. Okay. Just that reflection of the Earth's light off the moon can kind of reconstruct vaguely where the continents are and like what's ocean and what's not ocean. So maybe you could do something kind of like that off of like a dust cloud of the Milky Way. Okay. But I, that's, I think, still just like a stretch. That's not currently possible for sure. Um, so yeah, so no, we, we never seen, we've never seen the Milky Way. I mean, in some sense, you always see the Milky Way every time you look up at the night sky, but you never well, see in all of the Milky Way. Well, you're in right. it. Exactly. And those yeah. are stars... The Milky Way is made of stars, mm -hmm. right? Or we, they could also be little universes, right? I mean, is that right? I said no, no, not universes. I'm sorry. The universes. I'm confused. Universe, big, galaxies, smaller galaxies. Solar yeah, system. so those are all stars there, and those stars may have planets orbiting them. Yes. What what we've sort of learned is that it's likely if you just pick a star at random, it's the most likely situation is that it has at least a planet around it um so what does that say about inflation and the continued expansion is it does it tell us that eventually these stars break up and did they no so locally we're not affected by that expansion okay that expansion is something that you only see when you zoom out to like scales that are okay. like millions of light years. Okay. So locally, gravitationally, we're dominated by the gravitational pull of the sun, not by the gravitational push of the dark energy. Okay. Right. But if you look at two galaxies that are a million light years away, their gravitational pull does not dominate over the... Okay. So, so what will happen is like... You know, we'll just kind of get our little local cluster of galaxies that includes like Andromeda and stuff. We'll kind of get further and further away from other ones. And, you know, we might even get too far away from another galaxy and we'll just kind of be the Milky Way by ourselves, more or less. Um, wow. But that's like, we're talking many lifetimes of the sun <laughs> <laughs> later. Lifetimes um, of the sun. Yeah. We got, I mean, we got, we got people on the border of Ukraine. We got climate change. <laughs> like, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm not worried about uh, <laughs> this, like, expansion thing at all. So by the summer, it should be pushing back images. Now, do entities on uh, back on Earth, they have to bid for time there or purchase time on telescopes? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a proposal mechanism by which anybody can write a proposal and submit it, and they're, like committees that sort of democratically decide what gets used when and there might be some priorities since you know the u.s did, did like fund this instrument but um but like 
you know, Europe launched it, and right. so I'm sure that they have a lot of stake that in it, too. gives you hope for humanity, so, though, right? I mean, That's one thing you know? that I uh, honestly, in every one of my physics classes that I teach, I bring up, is that, like, big science is, like, maybe the only thing out there that is just so internationally collaborative that, like, and we're talking, like, literally sworn enemies will be, like, putting government funds into the same technology like that's crazy right um so it's a curiosity yeah so that's that's really awesome and that's like something that where science truly does sort of you know it doesn't transcend politics entirely but it does sort of give hope that there is some mechanism by which people can like have common causes and sure. come to agreements and stuff so yeah no that's really exciting i think that like you know throughout this entire crisis you know, U.S. and Russia scientists are sitting side by side at the Large Hadron Collider, or sitting awesome. side by side. You know, at that Chinese. Mauna Kea. You know, Chinese. Yep. There are Chinese astronomers yep. that are at the European Southern Observatory looking at stuff. Like, so yeah. I mean, there's definitely some as tensions rise. There become it becomes a little bit harder for like a foreign national to be in like a national lab or something. Yeah, you know, communication, all but that it, stuff. Yeah. So, but but at the end of the day, like the scientists, like they don't. They don't give a shit about that yeah. stuff, you know. Like my advi- nor, nor should they. Yeah, my advisor Sergey Dubovsky is a Russian guy, and he's awesome, and he works at NYU, and he like will. That's what it should be. be. Yeah, it's great. So they launched the the web to simplify it, and they're calibrating it, and maybe let's just throw a date. They're going to say July third. We're going to start, you know, really putting this thing to task. Are there like talk about what's the schedule like? Not that you would know it intrinsically but there has to be a schedule okay we're going to look in this region first or, or maybe i'm looking at it wrong is that i'm looking at it oh, wrong? oh no you're right i mean i pro- i actually am not a practicing astronomer i'm more of like a mathematician sure. than anything so i could not give you the details but what i can say is that i would not be surprised if the first several years of the instrument are already booked that all the proposals have been made they've been vetted and they already know like okay this is what we're going to do from this time to this time, this time to this time, this time to this time. So, yeah, no, that's all been taken care of a long time ago. So, but conceptually, uh, help me understand this. So, you have this telescope in space. You can turn it any direction, is it, or is it limited? Right. So, it is limited because you have to always Shield. be shielding okay. the Earth and the sun. And okay. so, so, this thing can sort of, like, rotate right and it the earth is moving around the sun and so you do get different patches of the sky but i don't think it has access to like every part of the sky or something yeah i would be surprised okay but still a, a lot a big swath of the Plenty sky of right galaxies, okay yeah. so do i guess my question is how do they determine like which spot to like start zooming in on because i mean there's got to be i'm sure they know where they want to try to go look and what direction through through math and so forth but like mm. what goes into that that's a good question um there are some super old galaxies that we like just barely were able to see with our past infrared telescope so spitzer it was an infrared telescope okay. and i think it was at one of the other lagrange points one of the stable ones um and it sort of was in the triangle of earth and sun and it had a shield on its back to sort of stop the earth and the sun but it was, it wasn't nearly as good as web um and it did see some super faint galaxies from really far away like our largest redshift galaxies um but so like we already know of some things that we'd like to actually look at with a better instrument so probably that i would guess is on there um and yeah i mean i wouldn't be surprised if people kind of knew the directions of space enough to know like you know we're not going to be able to see through this area because there's just like a lot of dust and clouds and galaxies but pretty much if you look in any direction this is one thing that hubble taught us if you have ever heard of the hubble deep field image yes yeah so basically yes. hubble it took a picked, patch it just looked at and it kept blowing that up and just seeing deeper and deeper into that it just never ended <laughs> exactly yeah like the point of that was that they had no idea what was going to be in there they just said what would happen if we took just a complete black patch on the sky that you can't see anything in and we just stared at it and what they saw was just an amazing zoo of galaxies and everything and so i think that like there's probably reason that like it that there's a lot of different there's probably they're probably going to do like scanning maneuvers to try and like look for things um another thing that we didn't mention actually that james webb has on board are really good spectrometers okay um so one 
really convenient thing about physics is that the universe is made of atoms and that atoms emit light in a very signature way that because atoms have these electrons going around their nucleus and because of quantum mechanics the electrons can only jump between very specific places and those very specific jumps these quantum leaps correspond to very specific colors of light that they emit right and so what that means is like you can look at a star and be like oh yeah there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere of that star which is like crazy because it's you know potentially thousands of light years away um so webb has really powerful spectrometers and they're actually going to look at at stars that we know have exoplanets around them, so planets orbiting them, um, where the planet goes in front of the star and eclipses the light mm -hmm. from the star, and they're going to use their spectrometers to look at what kind of light is coming from the star and what changes whenever the planet goes in front of it. And from this, they're going to be able to infer atmospheres from That's exoplanets, cool. which is super Yeah, cool. I, I would think most most humans on earth would dig that i mean oh, come yeah. on that's that's i a, mean i can understand that exactly and that's a big thing that i think is driving a lot of this you know public interest in a lot of this stuff is the idea that there are not just like other cool physics things like stars out there but there's potentially life right. out there there's potentially right, yeah. like other worlds out there um and so yeah so that's very that's really exciting so if we're going to be looking back in time, theoretically, right? Because if we're looking at photons reaching us now that are visible to us now that may have left their point of origin, what, what, what 13 billion light years away? Is that possible? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I mean, so what we're looking at could already have been decayed and dead for millions of light years. Oh, for sure. That's the object true. Yeah. right? The that gave off that light. Yeah, everything that we're looking at is long gone, probably. I mean, un unless we see. Um, see, that's fascinating to me. Like that, that, I don't know if the public gets. That. I don't think that's ever been conveyed to the public because I've watched a lot of documentaries. <laughs> and I, don't, I mean, that's. Yeah, I mean, there are long lived. Th so the the lifetime of a star um, decreases with the fourth power of its mass. So what that means is like really massive things die mm -hmm. way faster. And the intuition there is that if you're more massive, that means that you're kind of compressing yourself more, which means that the fusion reactions are mm -hmm. happening faster, so you're just running out of fuel faster. If you're lighter, then like you kind of use your fuel a lot less quickly. It's the so, path to supernova, right? Yeah, so eventually <laughs> really massive stars, they might only live a few hundred million years. Got it. Right. Our sun is gonna live about 10 billion years total. We're about halfway done. We're about five yeah. billion years in, it's got another five billion years to go. Um, but there are other stars that are like if, it, if you have a star that's 10 times lighter than the sun that means it'll live 10,000 times longer Got because it. it goes like the fourth power of the mass so there we there might be things back then that we could see that are still around today um, but those things are also super dim like the reason they live so long is because they don't emit a whole lot of light and so most of the things that we can that see they turn the dwarfs is these are right? red dwarves are the names of these kind yeah, of stars. Yeah. So yeah, after that, um, that's after they've gone supernova. No, no, no. So yeah, the initial distribution of mass that falls into it, like how much stuff falls in, that determines what kind of star it is. Okay, right. And so these things are red dwarves, and they'll always be red dwarves. Okay. What you're thinking of might be white dwarves, which is like a kind of remnant object after a kind okay. of supernova. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So red red dwarves can live a really long time. Um, but they're really dim, and so we're probably not going to see one of those from that far away. We're going to see, like, an entire galaxy of stars or something like that. Right. Looking back on the time thing, is just still... that That's the closest, I think, to, to quote-unquote science fiction that the public is seeing unfold in real life. I mean... Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like, in some sense, it's, like, n it's, like, kind of trivially true, in the sense that, like, you know, you're looking at me back in time. Right? Yeah, right. theoretically. You know, um, yeah. it's just, you know, light travels about one foot per nanosecond. And so since we're about, like, five feet away, right. you know, you're looking at a five nanosecond old image of me. And, like, we have devices that can register times on the order of nanoseconds. Measure that. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you're looking back in time, you're looking at me. But it's, like... I'm not going to change appreciably in five nanoseconds. Got it. Um, so it's not that big a deal. But yeah, if you just keep looking further and further away, then that becomes 10 nanoseconds, becomes 10 seconds, becomes 10 years, becomes 100 years, right? So yeah, it is kind of wild that like it really limits like what you can do in terms of interstellar travel. Um, Certainly. Even if you could go to, say, the closest star, Proxima Centauri, and it has exoplanets around it, so maybe we will one day have something there. 
it, if you just sent a message and was like, hey, what are you looking at? And then it sent back, I just saw this thing. That would take eight years. It would take that is insane. four years for that your message insane. to get there. And That's... then they'd get it and they'd look around, report, and then they'd send it back. And so like you could literally just send a text or whatever every eight years is like the only thing you could do. And that is like a limit of physics. That's like the speed of light. There's no so, way to speed that up at all. I mean, every physicist who's ever said something like this has been wrong, but I'm going to say it anyways. There's no way to speed it up. <laughs> um, what I mean by that is, you know, really we don't really know i mean like we don't have like a total theory of everything yet um but yes as far as i as far as my knowledge of physics goes there's no way to speed that up um there are like you know theoretically possible wormholes and things like that i thought that was all science fiction so that's that's a worm based on science no that's based on science but like may like that's like so that's where you fold space and you make the shorter the when it's exactly. folded or to shorter distance. Yeah, space itself is like a fabric that yeah. is able to be, you know, contorted by matter and energy. And in principle, if you have the right distribution of matter and energy, you can make some really weird shapes. And one of those could be like two planes where like one sort of comes in and meet, reaches another one. So the long way is sort of way longer than going through the middle. Now, okay. this is, you have to picture in your head three-dimensional space that's like embedded in a higher dimension so you could even imagine what it looks like to go that short way but anyways it is possible mathematically but there is no distribution of matter and energy that exists today in the universe that can do that i think is the point so it's like yes in principle those are those come from real equations but it doesn't come from real circumstances so okay let's I think I, my mind just has finally been opened up to this, to this one thing that if another being or another civilization came to us, odds are likely if that actually happened, they would have to be dealing with a whole different set of physics, more advanced physics potentially than what we're dealing with to make that trip here. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, we have no They couldn't do it under our physics, laws of physics. No, I mean, they could, like, in principle, if humans really wanted to, if we all kumbaya and became a global citizen and we all, like, put our resources to it, we could go to another planet right now. It's just that it would take, like, tens of thousands of years. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the, you, the answer to your question is, if an you know an alien or something came here right now and it was still able to communicate with like other parts of the galaxy and it still had like a connection to you know its home planet yes that would not be possible with our physics because of pure distance alone. just because of the size of the universe yeah Got it. but could it come here and just be like yeah we were cryogenically frozen we left our home planet ten thousand years ago and here we, we are yeah if we go back like then no, that that is possible, and we could do that today. One thing that I think also is worth mentioning um, is that special relativity means that objects moving at different relative speeds have different like times, like clocks ticking, mm -hmm. right? So that's the clock in the plane experiment we exactly, figured out yeah, all those like, years ago. So not only are you looking at me in the past, but like if I'm jogging relative Based to you, speed. my clock is ticking differently. Also, because of general relativity, if I'm at a different altitude than you, the gravitational field affects the rate of my clock ticking. So one thing about the speed thing is that if I went 99.99% the speed of light, I, in my reference frame, could get to Alpha Centauri in maybe like two days. Okay, so from a person on Earth, it would take four years because I was going roughly the speed of light is four right. light years away. Right. But to me, it just took like a couple of days. So Your like, body would only age two days. Exactly. So like we can go, as long as we can get arbitrarily close to the speed of light, we can which go. Which we can. Which we can. But like, let's just say like, you we, know, we have. Someday we can. We're able to really efficiently create antimatter and we can make these antimatter bombs behind us that like give us like little impulses that add up over time. Like somehow we do that. Seems okay? like you got to figure it out there. Yeah. I got, just, <laughs> if anybody wants to invest, I'll be. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, let's say we did something that allowed us to get very close to the speed of light. We could go arbitrarily far, right? Photons okay. experience no time at all. Like that light that is coming to us mm -hmm. from that galaxy, if you were that photon, you would have instantly went from that galaxy to us. Um, but for somebody that's on Earth, if you go 
to Andromeda, which is like a million light years away, it would take you a million years. So if I, even if I was going so close to the speed of light that took me 10 minutes to get there and back, I would go there and back and it would be 2 million years on Earth. And so what that means is that you can't really have a cohesive interplanetary culture, or I should say inter like solar system or intergalactic culture. Because of that fact. Because you just can't share information which makes a culture a Because generations go by. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you like, know. it's... <laughs> you know, Because we're, we're all not living... We all would not be operating and communicating within the same time frame. Exactly. Like, if something might come back to... We might think that we saw aliens and they would think they're just coming home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... It would just be like, yeah, someone like, like, oh, what's this like weird like past thing that just came back? <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, that's kind of what limits this sort of Star Trek way of seeing things. The upshot of relativity is that we can go several light years away in less than several years. But the downshot is that if our entire civilization has to go there because we will ca- like disconnect the culture the language the everything from that original source and that's mind-blowing though yeah. I mean, that's and i guess that's that that's been the, the uh preface or the premise of a lot of science fiction for decades right yeah one of my it often f- goes over the public's head how they got there but that's the, as essence right yeah no one of my favorite scenes in any science fiction thing which i think they did a really great job was uh, interstellar uh, that movie with matthew mcconaughey mm-hmm. and everything whenever they are near this giant rotating black hole and there's a planet that's orbiting this giant rotating black hole. And they were trying to see if this was like a habitable planet they could go to. And there was some sort of device that, that had information on it that they needed to go get. But they realized that when you go closer to a black hole, time starts ticking more slowly. So whoever stays back, time is going to be ticking more quickly compared to the people who go down. Right. So they go down to this planet, pick up this thing and come back takes him like nine minutes the guy in the ship is just alone on a ship for 20 years and he's just like on the ship waiting and he's like an old man when they come back um, you must have enough provisions to make it huh? <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean in the context of the movie yeah, yeah. um and uh and that is a hundred percent science fact that is not science that's fiction nuts. at all like that this is, is nuts. that's just like a a plain, simple consequence of and Einstein's Einstein theory. Einstein figured that out. Yeah. One man on this little rock. It's pretty amazing, yeah. That, that is amazing. Like, you know, I try and push back against the sort of, like, lone genius narratives of science because it does, you know, all ideas are based off of prior ideas. Yeah, and, right? for sure. But that being said, general the theory of general relativity by Albert Einstein was, like, one of these, like, singular moments where, like, he... You know, I think we would have figured it out eventually, but it would have taken us another, like, 20 years for sure. That, like, he just, like, in about 1905, 1906, he kind of started thinking about it. And then he just, like, pressed forward for about 10 years till 1915 and then was able to, like, figure this thing out. And it was, like, way out of left field. (laughs) So talk talk about that. We're here. Um, What does your knowledge of... um but what was society... What was the pushback like for him? How did society receive that formula? Um, so by 1915, Einstein was pretty famous already. Yeah. So like, you know, Einstein born 1879, he, um, you know, was born in Southern Germany, went to high school, like Munich, eventually went to Switzerland Mm -hmm. and went to college. Um, and then he kind of didn't do the traditional path. He went to be a patent office worker yeah um yeah. and so in and in, in the years of being a patent office worker is where he just did some incredibly groundbreaking stuff so like he published he was his, bored on his day job probably huh? it was amazing yeah and, and, appa- and like he got promoted through the ranks of the patent office so he did a good job as a patent clerk okay. as well okay. um and at the same time yeah i mean he basically in 1905 alone one year he publishes the theory of special relativity which has to do with okay. like when you're moving at different speeds clocks stick at different rates okay he published the um his paper on Brownian motion, which basically infers the size of atoms based off of the random motion of like particles of pollen floating in water. And by the way, people weren't all convinced that atoms even existed in 1905. So he like basically proved atoms real. And then, and he also did the photoelectric effect, which is 
I think the first true quantum research paper where he actually like said no light comes in these little discrete packets of energy these quanta of energy right. and they interact with things in this quantized way as if they were like little particles of light he did that he, he wrote his the e equals mc squared paper <laughs> equating energy and mass and he defended his phd thesis <laughs> in 1905 <laughs> so you know a lot of this stuff wasn't like instantly accepted mm -hmm. the light quanta stuff was like super controversial um for like a decade okay um relativity actually was pretty well accepted Received. the special theory yeah and and the reason was was because people already knew something was up like electromagnetism this theory that you know eventually got a bow put on it by maxwell in the mm -hmm. late 1800s it has some really weird features that you cannot explain with newtonian physics um it has this property that you know the way a magnetic field acts on a particle has to do with the speed of that particle if a particle is moving quickly the magnetic field act bends it a lot right. if it's moving slowly it doesn't and according to newton that creates a problem because speed is not like an absolute thing like right now, you and I would say that we're at rest, but somebody who's standing on the surface of the sun would say that we're careening 66,000 right. miles an 100%. hour. And so 100%. how can a force be dependent on speed if that's a relative concept, right? And so people knew something was wrong. People knew that Maxwell's equations did not you know, obey the right mathematics when you go from one reference frame to another. And so something had to fix that and special relativity just like fixed all the confusion with that like immediately and so people were like okay cool this so is it was probably. accepted so it was accepted. It wasn't pushed back is it, is it true that he pushed back or einstein pushed back so hard on quantum mechanics but he ultimately invented it right he pretty much invented quantum <laughs> mechanics yeah so so okay this is 1905 invents quantum mechanics invents relativity um and then he starts applying quantum ideas to not just light but also matter by calculating specific heats of metals and things like that um and then he just goes into a deep tank trying to understand gravity and this this is like 1911 1912 this is when niels bohr and people like that were trying to figure out the atom and the orbitals right. and stuff. So right, Einstein right, right. takes a break from quantum mechanics um, and then just goes like hardcore on his theory of gravity. And why he needed to do this was because, you know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But according to Newtonian gravity, there's no sort of like propagation of gravity from one place to another. The way that there's a propagation of a, an electric field, electric field actually takes time to get from point A to point B. But for Newton, if the sun disappears, the earth just starts moving tangent to the circle that it was on. But Einstein was like, that can't happen in my theory because if the sun disappears and the earth starts moving tangent, there is a reference frame mm -hmm. in which the earth is moving tangent, but the sun is still there. Right. Like simultaneity gets messed up in relativity, right? What is now is different across different points in space. Certainly. And so he's like something like gravity has to be a sort of field theory, the way that the electromagnetic field is this sort of like theory of propagating field. And so, and he had to make that relativistic, like compatible with his theory of relativity. And his, you know, insight was that, the thing that makes you pull on things gravitationally is very special. Electric charge has nothing to do with your mass or anything like that. It's just you can have a really heavy thing that has electric charge. Mm -hmm. You can have a really light thing that has the same electric charge. Mm -hmm. But how much you pull on something is exactly the same as how hard it is to just accelerate you. Meaning, if you have a lot of mass, it's really hard to get you moving. Like an elephant in space would be really hard to get moving, right? But an elephant in space also attracts things hard. And Got so it. somehow there's a connection between your resistance to moving through space and time and mm. your ability to pull things in towards you. Attraction. And so Einstein was like, maybe that means gravity is not like a normal force like electricity and stuff like that. Maybe gravity has to do with space and time because these things are connected, the gravitational pull. And, you know, you could simulate gravity by just accelerating. Right now, there could be an alien that opens the door and says, you haven't been on Earth at all. You're just on an elevator that's going upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. And there's nothing in this room that could tell us whether that's true. Like, acceleration can mimic gravity, which Got means it. that maybe gravity has nothing to do with space and time. So that's Got what it. the 1915 general relativity was about, was this theory of how matter and energy bend space and time in order to create this sort of manifestation of gravity. That was controversial. So uh, people were, 
some people liked it a lot of people didn't no, no, um, is that did, was that part of his um sophisticated argument with niels bohr uh that is later okay um so this is 1915 einstein took a break this from quantum to do okay. that niels bohr wrote his paper on the hydrogen atom in 1913 so this is happening at a pretty similar time okay so einstein invents general relativity curve space time is amazing and then he gets back to quantum in 1917 he writes like an incredibly important paper on quantum mechanics again after that but he doesn't believe um, in it then. so so he <clears throat> does but he doesn't like it. I the, think he he the didn't way. like the randomness of it. The um, nonsensical I randomness. I think that of it. is not. Or that's just folklore. Sh- that is a little bit folklore. He okay. did say like God does not play dice, but it wasn't he, I, spooky action in the distance. Yeah, <laughs> like the, the non-determinism of quantum mechanics. He actually was the first person to kind of introduce that in like a rigorous way in this 1917 okay. paper about like how light was emitted and absorbed randomly. And that was his wheelhouse, by the way, the sort of random statistical mechanics of fluctuations. Okay. That was like the tool set that made Einstein so famous. His very first set of papers in 1902, 1903 were about the statistical mechanics of fluctuations. The Brownian motion thing I told you about was mm-hmm. about the Paul statistical the mechanics of fluctuations. The photoelectric effect had to do with fluctuations in the energy density of the electric field and how that signify that the field must have these little particles in it. Like all of his stuff is sort of in the theme of this okay. idea. And so that non-determinism and stuff about quantum mechanics, he was like pretty comfortable with that. His problem was just that you can't, you don't have a local real theory in quantum mechanics. And so let me say what I mean by local okay. and okay. what I mean by real. By real, I mean when I'm not observing something, it has an independent existence, right? That you can say that the electron was somewhere around the atom. It just, I don't know where it is, right? That's what, by real, I mean, it has an independent reality outside of any kind of interactions. Got it. By local, I mean that, like, you can't do anything here that affects what happens on Alpha Centauri unless you wait four years for that, you know, signal to get Got there. Got it. And what you can do in quantum mechanics is you can create entangled states. You right. can create particles that can separate themselves arbitrarily far away. This is the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper. So in like the, the distance 1930s. is not an issue. Yeah. So there's nothing to do with space. It's just like so that in some sense, if you measure it over here Mm -hmm. you'll know with a hundred percent certainty what the result of a measurement will be over here do they spin the opposite like the the particles spin so there's opposite direction yeah so there's many different ways to create these entangled states the famous one um it's actually a reformulation of the einstein podolsky paper but um by bell later in the john bell in the 60s but the idea is that you could take a particle like a higgs boson Mm -hmm. or a pi zero meson something that doesn't have any charge okay and that has a short lifetime and it'll decay. And when it decays, it decays into photons. Right. Photons have spin associated with them, but pions and 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 Higgs bosons, these things are are do not have this quantity called spin, which okay. is this intrinsic angular momentum to them. And so in order to conserve this property, if one's going up, the other one has to go down because they came from something that didn't have any sort of Got spin it. associated with them. Got it. And so they kind of create two photons that are like this. Now, what quantum mechanics does is it tells you that like one will be perfectly anti-correlated with the other. But what John Bell showed later is that there is no consistent way to say that it had a spin. You just didn't know what it was. Okay. This is what's like kind of hard. The Bell inequalities are a really important okay. part about quantum mechanics that are hard to describe. But it's basically there's a difference between it is possible to come up with consistent answers for what this could have been before you looked at it, but we just don't know what it is because maybe there's some non deterministic blah, blah blah. What Bell shows is that there's no consistent way to assign variables to reality okay. given a certain set of measurements, which means that it's not that it one is spin up and one is spin down and we just don't know which one it is until we measure it and then once we measure one we know okay yeah the other one was By down default. but the point is is that there is no you can measure about a bunch of different axes and you can create a really clever experiment to show that there's no consistent way of even assigning spins to it before you actually take the measurement so i mean this is kind of like you know when you play 20 questions i have something in my head 
right? And you mm. ask me a question, is it bigger than a microwave oven or is it right. is it fine right. in my house? Right. There's a real thing in my head, like a stoplight <laughs> that I have and, and I'm trying to like, you know, you're trying to guess what it is. Nature doesn't have a real thing in its head. You ask questions to it and it cleverly just gives you consistent answers, but it doesn't have anything in its head. So like you can keep, okay. at, you know, you can keep asking me questions. So there's no answer. It, They're it, not hiding the answer from it. Exactly. You. It means <clears throat> there is no local reality. <laughs> that the thing that exists is this extended quantum object that is not like two individual things, right? It's one thing that is many light years in size in some sense. Oh and my that, God. And that really, that is what <laughs> Einstein didn't really like. Because, I mean, he understood that it couldn't causally affect yeah. anything right it's not that i could send a message by it. like i can't like rotate this one do a certain thing and that'll make this one rotate and then i could like make a morse code thing like that oh, so i thought you could um, do that <clears throat> no because once you observe it that's it uh, you know like okay. it's not that i can like catch uh, it and then uh, turn it and as i turn it it turns over okay. there okay. it's literally it's a, it's a property of the information of the universe that i will know what the result of your experiment will be. There's nothing I can do to tell you that this is going to happen ahead of time, but if we spend four years meeting up with each other, then I'll say, you saw it down, didn't you? And you'd be like, yeah, it was down. How'd you know that? And you'd be like, because we were looking at the same thing extended several light years that, away. That's a hard concept for the layman to get their head totally. around. Yeah, and that's why I understand why like people think like, oh, Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, ah, he invented quantum mechanics. He liked, like, yeah, he, he, was a, he was a master of it, but he also, there were features of it that, you know, that that kind of made it difficult to imagine a sort of like reality that was sublime and everywhere existed and that we were mere just actors looking at this like it's more complicated than that unfortunately um okay all right let's uh turn it's all interconnected but let's just turn uh, the page a little bit let's talk about parallel realities again i mentioned to you before the show i have a really hard time dealing with the idea that there's a theory of I don't know if it's a theory of um, all, is it many worlds or maybe I'm missing the mark, but the idea that there's all these slices of reality and they're infinitesimal and that every possible movement, reaction, opportunity, everything is out there in somewhere. Because when I try to wrap my head around that, Coop, it makes me realize that this slice that you and I are digging today, we're in with all these other folks, is really insignificant. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So can we unpack that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So a let's thin get, slice of reality. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Um, so what we need to do is we need to clarify there are two different concepts. Okay. That are, um, in principle, like not even related, but right. they get really confused and just sort of like the kind of popular culture sure. around it all. One is the multiverse. Okay. And one is many worlds. Um, the multiverse is this idea in cosmology, this the theory of like the whole universe, that there can be different patches of the universe that have different properties. And it's not that complicated and is kind of a necessary thing if you believe in inflation which makes a lot of predictions that mm -hmm. we seem to be correct so the point is the following thing um we have to talk a little bit about what a phase transition is okay um so you know how there are these rocks you could find on the ground that are magnetic right mm -hmm. magnetite um this kind of iron oxide mm -hmm. um if you heat up a rock then it loses its magnetism because basically this the reason why it's magnetic is because there are all these little spins inside mm -hmm. of this rock that can align with each other and they like to align with each other like it's energetically favorable for them to line up okay okay um but if the rock is too hot then the random thermal jiggling of the rock is stronger is, is, a, is a higher energetic barrier than the actual attraction that makes them line up got it if you cool this rock Eventually, that jiggling is weak enough that the rock wants to line up again. Got it. Right? So this is, I think it's called like the Curie point or something, whenever it goes from non-magnetic to magnetic. Anyways, if you take a, if you take a rock that has a magnetic field pointing in some direction, if you heat it up and then cool it down, 
it'll be pointing another direction. You heat it up, you cool it down, pointing another. Direction. Why? Because it's random. Like it just kind of it. randomly goes, and it just there's a whole set of different phases this thing could kind of settle into. Okay. Right. I mean, it's kind of the same phase, but there's different different uh, kind of low energy configurations that okay. it could kind of be in. Right. Um, okay. Great. So that happens with magnetism. The universe is permeated by these quantum fields. Okay. And these quantum fields can also settle into different states, different configurations. Now, string theory is this theory of quantum gravity. And a lot of the things that on our scale we think of as like the strength of the electric field, the mass of the W boson, a lot of these things that we kind of call constants of nature. Mm -hmm. These things pop out of string theory as just being like the direction of the magnetic field. Like they, okay. they turn out as just like the low energy random like state that the sort of that the fields kind of settle into. Okay? okay. Okay. So now keep that in mind. Okay. So inflation is this idea that if you have just like a constant scalar field, so don't worry too much about the terminology. You have some mm -hmm. energy that's mm -hmm. constant. Um, as you know, the cosmological constant causes an expansion. So you can have this like quantum field in the early universe. It's constant and it's slowly changing. Right. Then it'll cause an exponential right. expansion. The, right. The math works out. Alan Guth, congratulations. Yeah. Please out. Right. <laughs> now, the idea is... He's still milking that. <laughs> exactly. Seriously, get over it, buddy. Um, so, it, but it has to stop at some point because clearly we're not in this crazy phase now. Yeah. And so the idea is that like if you kind of have this like, you know, energy curve where you're just sort of slowly rolling down and then you finally get into a little valley, that when you finally get into that valley, that will cause that field to just vibrate all the other fields. And that's what creates all the quarks and everything. Okay. And that's called reheating. That's when inflation stops and the big bang happens. The big bang is later in this picture. It happens okay. after this reheating. Right? Okay. Um, okay. So, but what we also know from quantum mechanics is that you can always quantum tunnel to a place that is a higher energy. Okay. So quantum tunneling is where, you know, if you have sort of uh, two hills next to each other mm -hmm. and you're on this side over here, if you kick a ball, if you don't give it enough speed, it's not going to go over the hill, right? But quantum mechanically, it says that there's some probability... Straight through. You tunnel yeah. through, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's also true of this field, that there's some probability that you would just tunnel up the hill a little but it's gotta bit. But the probability is probably infinitesimally small. It's right? very small. But I can walk through that wall over there. Could happen. But right. Unlikely. But now we're talking about, like, the whole universe. Right. right? So the point right. is, is that there are regions of the universe which will r just randomly tunnel to a higher place in that potential. Okay. And once you're at that higher place, you keep inflating. The people who didn't tuttle stop inflating. Got it. And so all of a sudden, you get this huge inflation here. You get this huge inflation here. You get this huge inflation here. And it never stops because there's always a point in the universe that will tunnel a little higher. And although and it's so random and so infinitesimally small, it's the universe is so big. It'll expand it's bound to be to a happen. full Exactly. Yeah. And it'll expand to be its own full universe. And okay. in each of these bubbles, okay. you'll get a different set of so the bubble universe same theory so this is the, yeah the multiverse the bubble universe this is what all that means okay okay so in different patches of the universe of this internal inflation scenario you will have patches where the electromagnetic field is really strong patches where it's Got really it. weak because it's just like the direction that the sort of magnet Got is it. In, right Got um it. and so that's the multiverse which all basically right. says there's just straight up an infinite number of universes and the particle and things you know act differently in these different universes simply because the oh, that really makes you feel small yeah. i mean if that's if that's reality that's yeah <laughs> so I mean. this actually has interesting explanatory power because okay. there are really weird coincidences, numerical coincidences in our theories um, that are very difficult to explain. They don't really naturally come out of the mathematics. It's like these two terms need to cancel almost exactly in order to get this number to be that small. Okay. Right. Um, you know, and you could ask, like, why usually when you see a coincidence like that, there's like a reason for it. Sure. Um, but we're kind of running out of ideas for what the reasons for all of these different coincidences it could be like the mass of the Higgs, blah, blah, blah. And one explanation is, look, what you can show is that if these numbers were just a little bit different, 
you would not get like multicellular life, right? Got it. Like if the cosmological constant was a little bit bigger, then yeah. galaxies wouldn't be Just able to form. Just one digit off, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And we're talking one out of 120 digits off, Got right? It. And so what this suggests is this is called the anthropic principle that, okay, you know you have universes that have every value of the cosmological constant in them. You know that you're here and you can look around and ask the question, what is the... so? Therefore, it is likely that whatever universe you end up in, it's going to be one of these ones that has very special values for all the parameters. Got it. So what it says is... So is that what fine-tuning means? Yeah, fine-tuning fine -tuning is about like this, that these parameters have to... Are, are, there, there needs to be these mathematical coincidences to make them. And so what this is saying is maybe we shouldn't be looking for explanations in the math of why the numbers are the way they are. Maybe the answer to why they are the way they are is just that because they're every other way everywhere else and we're just not there. <laughs> like you're never going to get an observer in a universe that has a big cosmological constant. Got it. And so this is the anthropic principle that because humans exist, and it's not even about humans. I mean, the, the first actual prediction of the anthropic principle was Steven Weinberg in the late 80s okay. who said, okay, we know, you know, we don't, we know that a cosmological constant is possible and, but we don't, we just say that it's zero. And that was the case in the late eighties. We didn't know about it until the nineties. And what Steven Weinberg said is there's no reason for it to be zero, but we can get an estimate of sort of what the sort of upper bound is on how big it could be based off the fact that, you know, galaxies exist, that stars exist. Right. And he predicted a value for, he said, you know what, the cosmological constant, there's no reason for it to be zero. So it probably isn't zero, but because we're here, I bet you it, it's around this size. Cause if it were any smaller, this would have any bigger. And, it turned out that like 10 years later, we found the cosmological constant and it wasn't that far off. So he basically used this anthropic thing to make a prediction. And then wow. it, so in that sense, it's like a very, it is a scientific idea in some sense. It's kind of a bummer because it means that we're not gonna get like a nice neat explanation. It's just like, why is the earth this distance from the sun? You know? Cause it, it is. And it's like, cause yeah. it is. Yeah. And, and like, because we wouldn't be anywhere else. Like we can't live on <laughs> Jupiter. So yeah, we're here you know, because of it. Yeah, you, I mean, you could think it's a coincidence that's like, wow, every human that was ever born was born on the third rock from the sun. Does that mean the number three is like really special? I mean, we know that there's a two, there's a number one, there's a number six, number seven. It's like, no, every human that was ever born was born on the earth because humans can't live anywhere else. Got you know? it. And so that's the multiverse. We can't live anywhere. Okay. 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 What does many worlds mean? This is a different. All right. Idea. Okay. I, I, how I conflated those? I don't know. No, everybody conflates these. Okay. And it's like a very and so, um, many worlds is an interpretation of what quantum mechanics is telling us on a huge scale. Uh, on in in this room. I mean, like literally, like how we interpret what quantum mechanics means in any experiment. Okay. Okay. So the traditional what's called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics because Niels Bohr was Danish. He's from Copenhagen and he hid the Niels Bohr's Institute is there. And this was like him and Max Born and a couple yeah. of guys that came together that came up with this interpretation of Heisenberg. Um, the Heisenberg principle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is all in that school. Uncertainty stuff. principle. Yeah. Right. So um, the Copenhagen interpretation is basically that, you know, Let's take a simple quantum experiment where you take a particle and you fire it at the two slits, right? Have mm -hmm. you seen the double slit oh, experiment? Yeah. So this I think is we, like, we started, I think, our first podcast together talk with about that. The double yep. slit. So let's go back to the double slit. Okay. Right, you fire this particle, there's two little slits, and this particle um, will be incident on some screen after it goes through those slits. And, to a particle or a wave. And what quantum <laughs> mechanics tells us is that the pattern of where that thing ends up if you launch many of them will slowly fill out an interference pattern that you right. would expect from a wave right right we took this particle fired it and created this sort of wave phenomenon um okay so now if we were to sort of look if we had a little detector at the slits that was just a little toll booth and then whenever the electron mm -hmm. came in it would say it, it went through my slit and the other one would say no it went through my slit so like it basically tells us which slit it goes through Right, because in order for it to interfere, it would have to go through both. Absolutely. Right, that's like how waves, right, c two waves coming out of the slit would interfere with each other, right, like crests and troughs and things like that. If you can tell which slit the particle went through, um, then that interference pattern disappears, and you just get 
a clump of particles that end up behind slit one and a clump of particles that end up behind slit two. So the Copenhagen interpretation is essentially that the act of observing a particle collapses the sort of space of possibilities into the one that was manifest and then the universe continues on being quantum mechanical from there but in that moment of observation you what is called collapse the wave function okay that is like that's that's so hard for the public to grasp yeah because <laughs> it, what it basically means is that quantum mechanics gives you a world of possibilities right but you only ever see one right and so and when you do like if you observe the particle through slit one then it always ends up behind slit one it never ends up behind slit two so in some sense you constrain the possibilities mm -hmm. to that one thing and then by that's, observation and that's what it continues doing forever yeah and so that is a collapsing of the space of possibilities. So we call it the collapsing of the wave function. The wave function is a mathematical thing that describes the space of possibilities and weights them. But with what if what we had two observations going on at the, you know, like I had an observation and you had an observation. Yeah. Every time you would see it go through the first slit, I would not see it go through the second one. So it's kind of like that flip thing where it's Got like it. perfectly correlated. Okay. Like there's only one electron out there and you saw it. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that introduces something into the theory of quantum mechanics that isn't just there by itself, this act of observing and collapsing. Okay. Like, that's something that, you know, Niels Bohr had to do to like feel good about what quantum mechanics was saying. Because it make it's almost as if, no, no, there still is only one reality and like all the other realities go away as soon as I like make an observation. But that's like not inherent in the theory of quantum mechanics and even the act mathematically of collapsing the wave function violates Got the it. principles of quantum mechanics. Got it. So, but they just said that's the way it is, right? <laughs> this is a Copenhagen interpretation. It is the common interpretation. It's what every, it's what most practicing physicists today are doing in their heads when they're like doing okay. quantum mechanics, right? Okay. Now, Everett, um, this guy in the 50s, had this he wrote this PhD thesis papers he's very young where he basically says like let's just sort of take quantum mechanics on its own without thinking of observers that like are collapsing anything and let's just follow through logically what the sort of interpretation of this theory should be okay you know? um, Thomas and, Everett uh, yeah was it Thomas or Hugh or something like okay. that maybe Hugh Everett I don't know um there's another Everett who's a linguist, and it might be one of those. Okay. Two. Um, but, uh, yeah. So he he has this interpretation where he says, like, no, like, the particle still goes through both slits in a sense. It's just that those are now two sort of separate realities and that these realities are able to sort of interfere with each other, which creates this kind of strange thing. And that was like the many worlds hypothesis that sort of each component of the wave function that is, it's its own separate sort of reality that, um, you know, a way to try and make this a little bit more visceral is the Schrodinger cat thing where you have a cat in a box and there's a little vial that has poison in it and there's a particle that is quantum mechanically decaying like radioactive and it's like a r decaying particle when it decays it hits the glass and then it shatters and kills the cat if it doesn't decay it doesn't kill the cat okay so the fate of the cat is tied to this quantum mechanical process of this thing decaying and this this decay could be in a superposition it okay. could be in a state where it, it is like you know half the time decaying half the time not decaying so the wave function has both possibilities in it and what he, Everett would say is yeah there's a reality with an alive cat and there's a reality with a dead cat and when you open the box and you check to see if the cat is alive or dead you don't collapse the realities into a single one all you're doing is figuring out looking at one or the other which one are you in like okay. you open the box and you're like huh oh i'm in the alive cat reality sweet <laughs> um and in a sense that's this is actually the interpretation that i prefer and that i teach in my quantum mechanics class because this is like pure quantum mechanics without adding any additional thing about okay. observers having magical powers to collapse realities or anything like that this is just saying look Quantum mechanics has superpositions. It has these situations in which electrons can be in a superposition of states. We're made of electrons. Right. So why can't we just be in superposition? But that, but that sounds what like, what, what, in your de definition, it sounds like there's only two options. There'd only be two realities there. Okay. So, you know, the number of realities has to do with the 
sort of dimensionality of the wave function that describes that particular experiment. Okay. The space of possible experiments is nearly infinite, infinite. Right? so okay. the, the true dimensionality of the universe is at least you know there's estimates based off of black hole entropy that get made I mean, like there's 10, a number attached to that yes that make it 10 to the 10 to the 120 <laughs> um so that's 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 uh, that's yeah. every possibility um yeah so you know, and and that's whenever you include gravity, it like constrains what you expect to be the possible number of states in the universe. Um, without gravity, it's literally infinite. Like the standard the standard model of particle physics is not of gravity in it. It's based off quantum field theory, and the space of states is infinite in quantum field theory. So, yeah. So ba so every single one of these things is like another possibility. And so the real question is not really the collapsing that's happening because of some magical thing with physics. The real question is. Why do you, a subsystem of the universe, have this unitary experience of one sort of sequence of events happening through the universe? Our slice of reality. Exactly. I think that like quantum mechanics doesn't need another interpretation. It is just a. It, it is what it is. It makes predictions. It does what it does. The real question is what is what with consciousness, right? Mm. The real question is like, there's already many worlds you are experiencing a reality that I am not experiencing right now, right? Like there are, there's ways we could share information about our experiences. There's like ways that we can kind of build things sort of in common. But at the end of the day, you have a full simulation of reality around you right now. And it's completely different than actual reality, by the way, right? Like we know that like whenever you look at a cup, you're looking at the sort of electron wave function that's doing all sorts of crazy stuff and you can't see that. Your brain creates a reality based off what Your information it is. And so like that is happening I am pretty sure, I don't think I'm the only one that exists in the universe, but I'm pretty sure that there are another like 9 billion people that aren't just like philosophical zombies. They're like real people having subjective experiences. And so it's like, what? how is that happening? And I think that is going to be what sheds a lot of light on this interpretation of quantum mechanics thing, because that I think is what people have a hard time with, is that they are trying to say that their reality is the reality. the reality. And so that's why you need to collapse the wave function because I saw the particle here, so no one else is allowed to see it anywhere else. And like that's kind of the thing is the space of what happens in quantum mechanics is just so much vaster than this very unitary sort of thing where you're just like... So, and I have no idea how that works. I have no idea so, how consciousness works. Okay, so, the de so if you were to define consciousness, which, what's your definition of consciousness? For, our, for the sake of our conversation, because there's, there's a metaphysical religious bent that that, that word gets used in that regard, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this from is... From a scientific standpoint. Oh, scientifically, we don't have a functional way to describe consciousness. Like, we can't say, like, a, something that integrates information and does this and that is officially conscious. Okay. Um, and that's this is actually what's known in the philosophical literature as the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is not that conscious beings are really complex, that they sort of like you can give them information and they like do have aims and they have agency and they do stuff. Because you can in principle imagine like a machine that behaves just like a person but that machine may or may not be conscious like just because okay. every time you do this it does that doesn't make it conscious it could just be you know maybe that's not true but that's kind of the intuition that at least this guy David Chalmers who's a uh, Australian philosopher who okay. coined this phrase that that was his intuition that you could have things that were functionally conscious that moved about the world and acted conscious that didn't have consciousness because consciousness is something different that isn't like scientific in the sense that it's a you know the variables associated with the state mm -hmm. of a system mm -hmm. there is something that it is like to be me right there is something there's a subjective experience <laughs> to okay. being conscious okay that is in some sense separate like it just it happens in parallel to the sort of like description of the degrees of freedom in my body and things like that right that i could tell you scientifically what a green photon is but the experience of green is just something that is different right um a better example than green perhaps is magenta there is no magenta photon there's no single 
wavelength of light that okay. is magenta. Okay. Magenta is a comb- is when our eyes get hit with a combination of photons, our brain invents a color called magenta. <laughs> and, and it's just like it's made up and it's like in our brains and it's a, there's a quality to it. There's an experience of it. And can you say magenta is 40% red, 20% green, 30% blue or whatever it is? Like, I mean, I guess, but that doesn't really answer the question of like, what is magenta? Like it's this singular unitary experience of like okay. a color okay um, and so like that to me that's what makes consciousness really hard to talk about from a scientific perspective mm-hmm. is because we don't really have a language that is talking about what philosophers call qualia which is like the qualia is what they say are like experience units you know what i mean like okay. they're like atoms and then there are qualia qualia are like unitary units of you know when I say unitary, I just mean like they're just things that we experience. Like I'm experiencing pink when I look at this thing right, right now. And that isn't a property of photons. That's not a property of glass. It's not a property of retinas. That's not a property of eyes. Pink is an experience that we have. Is it like a knowing? <sighs> that gets a little deep. Like I don't That's know. a little meta- metaphysical. But it's I, difficult. I, yeah, it's, it's hard like, to articulate. Yeah. At least I, for me it is. One, one thought experiment that tries to help shed a little bit of light on this is imagine if you were in a room uh, that was only like black and white and you were only given black and white images they sort of like attached this thing to your head you couldn't even see yourself mm-hmm. they made sure that the room was perfectly black and white if they told you everything there is to know scientifically about the color red every single thing every possible piece of information in the universe about the color red if you then went outside and saw the color red would you learn anything absolutely new? not you wouldn't be able to determine it. you wouldn't be able to recognize it right i mean like you might know you okay this it. plant like is supposed to be red so that thing must be red but surely there's something new about experiencing red that is not contained in this sort of science of what red is and one way to think can't about explain it. color yeah so the, like color is like a really e- nice thought experiment for qualia i mean it's the same reason why like you and i might see different colors in a sense mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. i mean they have to all map onto each other like i call this blue you call this blue good we both call it blue but that doesn't mean that we're both experiencing the same thing when we see this got color it. blue do you know what i mean got it um, or shades and so forth exactly and so you know i mean there's like weird evidence of this where people like tr- tribes that you know and indigenous peoples who don't have certain words for certain colors like literally can't see them um there are uh this is a really this is um <clears throat> a really fascinating uh i think it's an, a radio lab episode or something where they okay. where they talk about this experiment where they went to this tribe where they didn't have different names for blue and green Blue and green were the same. They'd like point at the sky, it's like blue, point at the grass is blue, point at this, blue. like they're the same word. And so they took just 19 shades of green and one shade of blue and was like point at the one that's different. And they had no idea, no way to wow. do it. And it wasn't like there was, you know, blue green colorblind, there's like genetics, and, but like it's literally like their sort of like conceptual space mm-hmm. affected the qualia space the space of like what they were experiencing and like you know this is how do you quantify that it's crazy right? yeah i know and it's and it's maybe not so esoteric like if you if people experience wines differently if you know what to sort of taste for and things like that right like you know if somebody drinks like a thousand cinnamon coconut you know, yeah. all these crazy descriptions of Definitely. what they, they taste yeah um like and 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 it's not all bs like there are definitely people who can't really distinguish between wines but think they can but there are like sommeliers where you can give them like 10 different wines and they can identify them and so but if i drank all those 10 different wines like yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to identify them and it just and it just means that like literally the way their senses mm-hmm. are experiencing reality is just mm-hmm. different than the way that mine are um it's the same reality in a sense but like the so that, that's not I mean, to me like it, it's it's the same reality we're experiencing, but our interpretation of it is unique to ourselves, right? Yeah, but I mean, it's it's like it's not a computational thing where it's like I have seen a pickup truck 
before. And so I know, you know, we're both seeing the same color and shape and everything, but I know how to interpret it. It's literally like the color and shape of that thing might be different to different people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Can you kind of see that distinction oh, yeah. between sure. the sure. immediate experience of a quality sure. versus like, I know what to do with that sort of mm-hmm. image. Mm-hmm. And so, so anyways, that's where I think consciousness is like a super hard problem because like, it's really hard to even figure out you know, a lot of consciousness research today is like, let's just sort of functionally try and figure out how like intelligent things work and maybe we'll be able to attack this thing later. But that's that's the difference between the hard problem of consciousness and the easy problem of consciousness. The hard problem is we experience things. Okay. The easy problem, which is still incredibly hard, which we haven't solved, but there's at least a way to solve it, is like, can I, get, <clears throat> on the level of like neurons, could mm-hmm. I like explain like why you grab that cheeseburger instead? And it's like, yeah, you know, I, there's like some signals inside your stomach lining that send some chemical neurochemical things that like it activated this region and then this region. Like, Curiosity is like a, a bitch, man. I mean, <laughs> send someone down to determine yeah. why I grabbed the cheeseburger as the as the ham sandwich, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, can we talk a little bit before you go today about simulation theory? Because mm-hmm. that get bounced around a lot too. Like we're living in, you know, in the movies, the Matrix. So we're living in a simulation. Yeah. And I always poo pooed it as if ah, it's all the work of science fiction. But then you see more and more. I don't know. You, I, I go to more and more podcasts where it's like a real thing. Simulation theory is people are articulating this in ways well above my pay grade. That it's a thing. Yeah. So do you either buy into it or you don't? Is it one of those things like you either agree with it or you don't? Um. So. You know, the fact that, like, our reality could be simulated or whatever, I think that is just a very obvious, logical possibility. Okay. Um, and the one reason is, is because of what we're just talking about. Like, your reality is simulated by your brain. <laughs> like, you are, your brain is constructing this field of vision with these colors and these experiences. Yeah, just close your and eyes so, and it goes away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you're doing that. It's easy I'm to doing see. It. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, we are already in... Each of us are in a sort of simulation. We're okay. receiving information that is not the full picture of reality because classical physics isn't even correct. Like, but we're using evolution plus experience to like turn this information into a simulated classical physics reality that we look around us. So that's already true biologically. So could this really be a sort of Manifestation, some sort of dream inside of some other kind of information processing system, of course. Because, like, if, if my brain can do it, then probably something else could do it to make me think that it's my brain that's doing it. Like, why not? Um, okay. So, I mean, I think it is a logical possibility. Where simulation theory got interesting, and I, I believe this was popularized by Nick Bostrom, who's this guy mm-hmm. from, like, the Future of Humanity Institute or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, is Recently, he, right? Last 10, 15 years? Yeah, it was, it was in the recent past where he basically made the following argument that has some force to it and, like, requires some careful thinking to whether buy into it or not buy into it and this is that like okay imagine we get to the point in our technology where we could simulate some kind of reality or some kind of universe or some conscious entities inside of a machine or something Mm -hmm. like that if we can do it once we could probably do it multiple times and if, you know, the same, as soon as computers were invented, there were many computers that were all running programs and things like that, right? So the point is, is that if it's possible for us to do this, we'll probably make many different universes. <laughs> like, it, it's a natural. Inside of those universes, if the machine is significantly complex, they will probably make little universes, right? And so the point is, is if this is a reality if this is possible and this is debatable but like if it's possible okay which like you know why are these meat computers any better than our other computers probably not so it's probably possible if it's possible why would we be in the top stack you know what i mean like if there are potentially Ar- arrogance exactly <laughs> you know this is like this kind of copernican revolution where uh-huh. we realize the earth's not at the center uh-huh. of the, of the uh, solar system that if, if this can be done then you have to ask yourself like which one do i think i'm in and if your answer is there's a trillion of them and I'm in the first one, then you're probably full of it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so maybe there's some sort of you know mechanical constraint that in a simulated universe you could never create the phenomena of quantum mechanics or something like that because it is this sort of weird infinite dimensional mm-hmm. space of possibilities. So like you know there might be sort of information processing reasons why you couldn't simulate something that we 
wouldn't have been able to see was a simulation from like particle accelerators or something like that because i mean we're testing time scales down to like 10 to the minus 20 seconds we're 10 or length scales down to like 10 to the minus 15 meters like and also 10 to the 20 meters and also like 10 to the 15 seconds right and so like huge expanses in space and time we're like getting information about and so it would have to be a pretty impressive simulation if it was no doubt and there might be some argument that like it's just not feasible and some it would violate some laws of physics but the laws of physics could be simulated like you could go down this like rabbit hole that like makes it really difficult for, to for, say. for entertainment they usually say we're living in some computer game and they said don't laugh at it because we got to the point you know 34 years ago 30 or 40 years ago where computer games became a thing and, and if we're able to do it yeah someone could be pulling the strings on us and this could be all a very similar circumstance yeah. I mean, when we create artificial intelligence, if that happens, oh, when looks, it happens, it looks like it probably will, right? So you know, when that happens, where will that artificial intelligence live? Like, it might be have sensory inputs from the outside, but it also might be connected to the internet. And like, what is where is that? Right? You know, it's receiving information from not a place per se but from like a node of inform like a network right right and so is right. that network of information a different universe in some sense i mean it's kind of we supersede it in the sense that we could turn off all the servers and then that information wouldn't be there but if this ai was a program in a computer and didn't have like a webcam or something then it wouldn't know about this outside universe 100%. it would know from wikipedia that like people talk about this thing but like it's like that being in a room and never seeing red right got it and so like yeah i mean i think it is inevitable if, you know that there's going to be some form of philosophical question of a conscious thing that is not that is being simulated in a sense whether it were that thing i don't know I think also you have to ask yourself, like, what, how does it change the way you go about your life? Yeah. Like, you know, because in this simulation argument, there's nothing that says that this should matter to you. It just says that, yeah, probably we're, you know, somewhere in the stack. But, like, <laughs> so, hope they don't turn it off, you know. <laughs> there was um, a documentary I watched years ago, which really wasn't a documentary. I believe it was Brian Greene's. It, it was his annual science convention that's held in new york yeah the world science festival or whatever yeah he, he's and, a big organizer for that and at that some one of the symposiums within that festival on one year let's say it was 2015 maybe there was a panel discussion um and why this will make sense in a second why i'm laying all this out in his panel discussion was um green um and just a bunch of other you know i call them some of them rock star you know uh theoretical physicists you know that are just that's their career to be out public about it yeah. for better or worse i can see the guy's face i just can't remember um him and i think he came to duquesne two years ago because i was mentioning our mutual friend phil clark phil why didn't you get me a ticket to this thing but he came and gave a lecture um and he was in this group his name will come to me probably when you leave uh J james gates that's it yeah. jim gates yeah thank you sure yeah I like him. I like to listen to him talk. He's great. I've, I've yeah. always been able to enjoy his. The reason I bring him up, Coop, is he said something fascinating to me, which kind of like, excuse the vernacular, kind of was like a mind fuck to every other theoretical physicist on the stage. He's, Gates said, we just drilled down and and got to a point where, I guess he's talking about the atom, we got to a point where we discovered computer code that originated in 1982 by this person and it re repeats over and over and over again and they were like you found computer code from the maybe early 70s i can't remember he goes yes and it repeats over and over and over again and we don't know why but it's identical and i came away from that with also astonished as just the person in the public watching that going if that doesn't if that's true there's an indication to some kind of so he, he said that the, the code repeats itself over and over again mm -hmm. and it's computer code that we brought to the, someone brought to the forefront in the early 70s mm. have you ever heard of that i have not what i have what this kind of smells like but i don't know is that like and maybe i'm articulating it incorrectly too yeah i'll have to, I'll have to look it up and, and you know get touch base with you again on it um but yeah there is this sort of like 
quantum cryptography field. Okay. And there are like phenomena in nature that are sort of like formally similar to like quantum cryptography. Like what do you mean? Um, I mean that like any sort of thing that happens in the universe is in some sense a computation. Like it okay. is information that is like, you know, two particles bounce off each other. That's like information transferred from one to another. And what what I mean is that this algorithm, there are like algorithms that like are very useful in like cryptography and stuff like that, that are actually, there's like a physical manifestation of what that algorithm is in nature. Okay. And so, and so like- Randomly? It happens, or we don't know. That's right. the question. Is we and don't so, know. And so, yeah. I think that's maybe where this line of reasoning was: was that like somebody invented, not knowing about the physical world's example, this purely information theoretic comp- computer code that right. did this thing, and then we found something naturally that occurring in nature. Is what he implemented, said. Implemented, yeah, that actually was a naturally. But he occurring says it thing. was of a complexity which was, was, it was of a complexity which was just shocking. Like he's, you know, and like I think the other panelist, uh, Tyson, the grass Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah. yeah, he was like, why is this the why did why was this not known? Like, why is this not publicized? And Gage just didn't think it was that important, but he said, this is what we found, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's yeah, yeah so yeah, for next time, just yeah. To, yeah, for sure. But that that was, but that led into the idea of well, maybe it is a big compu- computer game we're sitting in, <laughs> someone's, <laughs> someone's, you know, I, I don't know, I mean. It, it it's it's one of those moments where you if you like this kind of stuff and you like science fiction to a degree you know it's just theories i mean you can't really dismiss anything entirely right yeah yeah i mean there are some theories that i think are more likely than others based off what we know but like i think that if we took our physics and our understanding of reality and technology and brought it to Isaac Newton, like, it would just seem totally insane. Um, you know, I mean, like, relativity would have seemed totally insane to, to Isaac Newton. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> they didn't even know that atoms existed, and, like, we're making transistors on the size right. of atoms that are, like, right. doing computations, you know. A big part of what took so long to understand our solar system is that, like, You know, it took Kepler, like, 20 years to, like, just compute things. (laughs) Like, the thing that broke open our ability to measure where the planets were uh, and to to calculate, like, trajectories enough to actually get an accurate picture of the solar system was the invention of the logarithm. Like, in 16... Oh, really? Yeah, like, the early 1600s, the logarithm was invented, and that you can use the logarithm um, to calculate really big and really small numbers. Um, there's like, have you heard of a slide rule yeah. that actually uses like logarithms to calculate yeah, yeah, yeah. like a calculator. And once that mathematical technology was invented, then Kepler was able to do the calculations necessary to come up with his three laws, which eventually proved the Copernican theory was right. Got it. And in the actual preface of his like Rudolphine tables, these like ephemerides, these uh, ephemerides, these uh, star tables that where he describes his laws, he thanks and that it's like an acknowledgement the guy who invented the logarithm. Wow. Um, so so yeah. So that's just to say that like you know what is even possible to know now is something like one of the biggest moments that this hit me is like i remember sitting in class as like a 22 year old okay and there was a homework assignment that was like this parameter is this this parameter is that blah blah blah. calculate the age of the universe and i just like thought to myself like this would seem pardon my french now batshit insane if like you told someone in the 1400s that yeah like one of the things you'll do as a young lad is like someone will be like okay homework calculate the age of the universe Universe. like that's like a totally good like right but like we can with like confidence like i can calculate that time and then i can look at what the sort of physical implications of that are and i could go out into the universe with the telescope and actually see that that's true and so yeah, it's like a we live in a weird time, and so science fiction is it's not as crazy as it sounds sometimes. No, yeah. and it, it, well, it, 
I dismissed out of hand the movies. The Matrix is just something fun to watch. I did, and it wasn't until like the mid two thousand five, two thousand six, my brain real started getting getting very curious in regards to all of this. And now I don't dismiss any of that out of hand because, based upon how fast our technological world is, yeah. I mean, does AI scare you? Yes. In what capacity? The thing that scares me the most about AI, actually, is that we will create something that can suffer and that we will intentionally or accidentally create an immense amount of suffering. Um, Like, you know... They'll make us suffer or they they will feel suffering. I think or they will feel suffering. Like, I think, like, you know, because we don't really have a grasp on, like, time and, like, how, how this, like, makes sense with something that is computing with a computer brain instead of a human brain. Like and a, consciousness, Yeah, right? like, imagine if you're conscious mm-hmm. and you can't die in the sort of natural way where you just expire because of telomeres in your chromosomes or something. Um, and that your kind of resolution moment of time what feels like a second to you um would be like an like a nanosecond to someone else right right and so what if like we create this sort of state that is like a state of where it suffers but it suffers for a trillion years doesn't expire (laughs) right it's just like we could just create like unbelievable amount of like i never thought of it like we could create the light of consciousness that is just an absolutely horrific experience i mean it must be pretty rough to be a baby like why do like babies like scream and cry all the time as they're like figuring out reality it's daunting it's like colors and forms and shapes and like the thing is is like consciousness is like kind of reflecting on the body. Like, have you ever noticed a baby? It, it it has to learn that it can move its hands and that it can move its legs and that those are its legs and its hands. Like, really young babies are like surprised sometimes when they see their own hand. And so, like, that's the thing is like, that's a pretty crazy process and it's pretty traumatic, I'm sure. But like, we don't really remember it. But I can tell you by looking at a baby that it's having a pretty rough time sometimes. Um, and you know, we could create that in a way that is completely uncontrollable in a way that could last for trillions of years in their wow. time in a way that, and so that's why i just like i feel like i'm worried about ai because i think we're not philosophically mature enough and we don't know enough about consciousness and what it is i think it's a little bit of a catch-22 because i feel like we're, we're going to have to like create consciousness before we can really understand it and play with it and understand its properties but i think that in the process of doing that we could just be creating a hell that is like worse than anything you could ever imagine um so you think at some point we will create some type of consciousness yeah i do i think we will just because like the brain is very complicated but i don't think it is like magical in a sense you know like we can cut this thing up and look at it and tell like how everything kind of works you know it's complex it's complex enough that we can't put it all back together in a way that makes sense and understand but like all the pieces are very understandable and so i feel like it's really just a question of complexity at this point okay Um, but it's like you know it might take 100 years 200 years before we figure that complexity out but i think it is something that is not like intrinsically impossible so Um, let's say just use the word cloning for a second you think cloning will become a thing at some point um like physical cloning or information cloning like copying good point because like the information will definitely happen right? yeah like can i can i just like upload my consciousness onto like a server and then i'm just experiencing that right falling apart over here (laughs) um and yeah i don't know i mean i think that it's I don't. We don't even know what information is relevant. Is it like the location of all the neurons in our brain, or is it some sort of like homeostatic chemical interaction between the neurons and their environment? Like, we don't know what signals are like the most relevant ones to qualia to experiencing the color green. Okay. Right. And so, um, you know, we know there's an optic nerve. Retina gets hit with photons. It sends a signal. We see cascades of reactions right. but i mean there's just so much happening so fast inside of our brain like things moving like trillions of times per second like moving and so we don't really know what is the relevant versus the not relevant thing and got it so i think we're very far away um really from from that sort of thing but i think what we'll do before any of that 
I think like the matrix kind of thing is possible. I don't think it's going to be a discontinuous thing where okay. it's like we create AI, it puts us in a prison or whatever. I think we're going to just smoothly transition into the matrix on our own accord. Um, I think that like I already, if you would have told someone 200 years ago, there could be a day where I am looking at my phone for like six hours or something like if throughout the whole day, cause I'm like writing an email, watching a movie, talking to a person. It's not insane for a modern person to have several hours, like looking at this like box. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, and that was the same with the television. It's not oh, just the phone, man. like TV back in the yeah, day. People like, yeah. I remember when I was a kid, we'd yeah. go home, my mom would go home from work and just watch TV all day. Yeah. And it's like, can you imagine telling someone like a couple hundred years ago, like we've got these little boxes of light and you will stare at them for half of your waking life. And it's like, and nowadays we're just like, yeah, it's cooler here than it is out there. Like all my friends are on so here. Fast like, forward 60, 70 years, what's going to be like. Exactly. Right. You know, once not, you know, I think contact lenses, glasses, I skin. Think, I think slowly augmentative reality is <clears throat> just going to like seep in more and more and more. Well, look at those glasses, Oculus is now. Have you, have you seen those? Have you pissed around with those? Yeah. My housemate has a, um, a valve index which is like a really fancy version of these vr machines and it's totally crazy and like i am scared by it like i go into it and it's like really rich and interesting and crazy and then when i take it off i get this really strange feeling looking around because like my brain is kind of like is this the reality or is that the reality? This is like kind of boring. This was like really colorful and interesting and colors here are kind of saturated and it's just kind of like... Is it going to screw up the human condition, you think, at some point? If I spent six hours a day in there and I only spent six hours a day out here, like I don't know what it, you know, would I just start preferring being in here all the time? Because I'm just like, oh, this is like so weird out here. And then it's just like people just might prefer to be in there. And then it's like we'll just slowly. And it's just archaic right now compared to where it's going to be. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, the biggest problem right now, which is like if they solve this problem, then I think it's all over, is that your brain has sort of proprioception. You can understand space without just seeing things and hearing things, right? You can feel when you move and that there just isn't an AI version of that. Like there's nothing that goes into the fluid in your inner ear and sloshes it, sloshes it around, you know, activating these little cilia that tell your brain that you're rotating or something like that, right? Because that's what we can do. Like Got we it. have like a, a accelerometer no, and things. It, my friend. And like if we can't do that then it completely changes the character of the experience like yes i it's kind of like watching a surround movie where it's like in every position and it is very engaging and stuff and it's like whoa even my periphery is filled by this but at the same time you're still like i'm clearly just like watching something like i'm not there is that the feeling i've never put an oculus on but is it the feeling that you, you still can tell you're watching are you still an observer you're not really in there yeah, I mean, it is pretty amazing because they do have 360 video where, like, I was in a Serengeti in Africa and I could look over here or I could look over here. Oh, that'd be cool. Up, and it was really cool. And, like, I thought that was really awesome. But it's like, you know, and you could still be scared by something running at you because it's, like, in your visual field. But, like, you're never, you can't walk around. Like, you, you'll get sick. It, I, I, if you have a game that, like, you can just like push a button and move it makes you sick because your brain is like i'm not moving why is my visual do, field doing do you that? have to set boundaries of movement when you first put those things on like mm -hmm. I, they said yeah we have we have like these space stations that um use lidar to basically map out the room and then if i get close to the edge of my thing like a grid appears in front of my face you can't and i'm just like whoop <laughs> so it tells you where you are so that you're not like moving around yeah um but yeah, anytime there's like, if it's like a visual thing, like Beat Sabers, this game where you have these lightsabers and you're hitting these boxes to the tune of something and like, that's like super fun and stuff, but it's like very different, like, then I can't just like feel like I'm walking around somewhere. I can't feel like I'm really present because there's never... How do they, how do they get past that? <sighs> Neural implants, something that intercepts the signal between your inner ear and your Musk brain. So, get on that. Exactly. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's one of the guys that scares me whenever it comes to this, like making things suffer. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you seen the recent thing where which he, one is it? Um, his uh, Neuralink 
company is in trouble because some people there's been some whistleblowers who are just like yeah we're just cutting into monkeys brains and like doing all these crazy things to them and if, wow. it, if they like doesn't work and they die we just throw them out and get another one like i believe so, that you know, i totally believe that if people are doing that to like primates which we have some like natural empathy for just because of evolution imagine the way people will treat an ai like how do people treat siri <laughs> like i would love to know that data of like how many people are like fuck you siri that's not what i said oh, you, you guarantee know I mean? it happens so like, often yeah so yeah the must scares me because he doesn't seem like he has much emotion you know, like people say, well, you know, he's he's autistic. I don't know. I I have no qualification to say any of that stuff. I can just see that he does make decisions purely based on what he determines is his logic, with no real compassion or emotion attached to it. That's my interpretation of watching him speak and watching this unfold. Yeah, I think it's hard to. I definitely understand that intuition a hundred percent. What I what what I would like to kind of push back a little bit of is it's like. We get such a crazy snapshot of celebrities' lives no that are so sort of like no biased based off of events that are curated based off PR. Or the writer stuff, of the article, writer of the article, like, and I know you're saying like you see actual videos of him too, and I think that is you know people have mentioned that he has this sort of like theory of mind that's a little different in terms of like how he sees other people versus himself, but like, yeah. So I think all we can kind of do is speculate, and I just I kind of want to be careful to this, but hundred percent. Um, but yes, there is not. I haven't seen much evidence to suggest to me that. He He's like thinking really hard about like he's more interested in innovation than like careful execution in some sense. And I think that's his greatest strength and his greatest weakness. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, an example. So I mentioned earlier that like I just got a Tesla Model yeah. 3. Mm -hmm. um, it's an absolutely amazing car, but there's some features of it that are just so dumb because he wants to be innovative. And when I say he, I mean Tesla's a giant company, right? right. But that they want to be innovative instead of being practical. Like, like, give me an example. For example, there's radar in the car that can very easily determine the distance to the car in front of me whenever it's snowing outside, right? But it doesn't use any of the radar that's in the car because they went to a vision only system where they take the front facing camera and use a neural network to try and determine where objects are in space. They made it more complex, um, right? Yeah. And the idea is that, okay, this information maybe is better than the radar information if you do it right. Like, and so in principle, we should move in that direction. That'll be the more sort of innovative way to do it. But at the end of the day, I drove to DC two weeks ago and there was so much slush on the road that the water hit in front of the cameras and then whenever it evaporated it just layered a solid crystal layer of salt over the cameras and i couldn't use cruise control for the entire trip and it's just like that's not thought he's out not well. trying to be practical he's trying to be new he's and it's like you know i think a that's a philosophy thing for him right i think so yeah and and like but at the same time like someone probably could have said that to him in 2008 which is just like why are you trying to make like a consumer yeah. grade electric car like right. that's not practical like make hybrids work our way up to it whatever yeah. and I'm really grateful that he was like no I'm going to like revolutionize how we think of what a car could be so like at the same time I think it is a, it is a quality of his that made Tesla what it is today mm -hmm. but I just kind of wish that now that it does exist that maybe someone else would refined. step in yeah. and be like look you've got a really good product you've got an amazing vehicle it's going to be really helpful for climate change if we get people onto mm -hmm. batteries instead of fossil mm -hmm. fuels like let's do it let's get onto it he's he, they they delayed production in the cyber truck in order to look into this like tesla robot like oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're working on these like robots that are supposed to be like butlers or whatever. And it's like, that's like, so we're not there yet. That's really dumb. Like right now we have a crisis where people are, I, I mean, I have a Toyota Tacoma as yep. well because I use a truck and I think there's a yep. use for trucks, but there are people who don't use trucks as trucks and just drive them around. Right. And that it consumes an enormous amount right. of resources. So the cyber truck is like a really dope thing it's like incredibly powerful and it's yep. got a huge battery and if and, it, and it forced the other manufacturers to do it to get into the game exactly yeah the, that, so, i think that's even we, we don't talk about his influence the market forces are huge. absolutely yeah. that's the thing that doesn't get talked about with musk is like he's forcing the rest of the competitors yeah. to step up Right. And I think that's super beneficial. I think in the net, he will have provided a great service to humanity. And so even though I think he is, I don't like him as a person, mm -hmm. I do think he deserves more sort of like respect in that like getting cars off of fossil fuels is a super hard problem. And he seems to have come up yeah. with a really 
good solution and even a capitalistic market solution to force other people to kind of play along, which in today's world you have to do. And no so doubt. I think that's like really impressive and important. And Tesla was about to go bankrupt many times and he was able to pull, you know, magic out of the hat and was able to get people to get on board and still follow him. I mean, it took decades before it was profitable. So yeah, I don't even know if it is profitable still. Do you, um, um, does it, yeah. that, in, in, in today's uh, economics, does that even matter anymore? I mean, right. I mean, as long uh, as growth valuation. Is right yeah. <laughs> you know famously amazon didn't turn a profit for like 20 years and so you know what's your thoughts on bezos as you observe him from a distance i th- bezos i bezos be- be- yeah, bezos I, bezos i don't know how to pronounce it either. i think it is um, bezos yeah he um i like him way less than elon musk because to me he is like elon musk why is he so interested in space on the one hand it's like you know just kind of a kid i'm I like rockets but also he has like a philosophy about sort of like you know i want to like extend consciousness to other planets he's and stuff pretty like principled that. in his he's, own principles he is principled about that like electric cars like that is like whenever he like t- gives talks about like where tesla is going and everything it's very much like we need to scale this up to get people onto batteries as quickly as possible and like we're going to need to mine more nickel we're going to need to do sure. this and so like you know whether or not he's an egomaniac or whatever that's one thing but he has these principles that i feel like are helping humans on earth with cars and helping humans in space mm-hmm. with spacex mm-hmm. and you know you could say oh he's just trying to get rich he made a freaking hundreds of millions of dollars back in the 90s. He didn't have to do any of this shit. So, like, it's not like he was poor and then he's just using this yeah, to try and get rich. PayPal, he was already right? very rich, PayPal. right? Uh, exactly, yeah. Um, and so, you know, whatever you think about him and, like, what he says about his politics and the unionization things going on at Tesla, like, I think there's lots of reasons to hate Musk, but I think that, like, he is a sort of principled person that is, like, creating real value for mm-hmm. humanity. Mm-hmm. Bezos, on the other hand, I mm-hmm. actually don't think that. You know, he has his own sort of space ambitions too, and I feel like they're. But, but did they come about because of Musk? I thought that, but actually, his company's older than SpaceX. Oh, it's a blue it just origin. Yeah, it just okay. hasn't been doing <laughs> very much. Okay. Um. So yeah, I thought that too, but actually, he was he was he's been into space also for a long time, but he's okay. he's more into like space tourism and stuff like that. It's yeah. a less sort of philosophical. Like Branson yeah. to a smaller degree. Exactly. Yeah. So. But, like, I think him with Amazon is about, like, him being rich and powerful. Like, I don't think he's, like, trying to think of, like, what does society need right now? What will make it a better place? Like, you know, it's not that I have something in principle against Amazon. Like, I use it a lot because it's, like, way cheaper to get things I mm-hmm. couldn't get elsewise. But, like, it is destroying local economies. And there, but and it's just, like, I feel like Bezos doesn't care about any of that. He's literally just sort of, like, I'm a businessman who's going to make a bunch of money by completely controlling the global market yeah. online yeah. and i don't see any sort of like problems that solves like it, it allows people to get access to global markets a little better but at like the cost of just consolidating all well, he's power. not picking a problem like you can make the argument that musk is picking a problem and solving it yeah the other you know, the, the, the carbon carbon fuels yeah you can't really make that argument, of Bezos. You can yeah. talk, you can say, oh, he put a foundation and gave two billion dollars away for this, but that was done after the fact. It wasn't oh, yeah. his mission or it wasn't his principle yeah. that drove him, right? Yeah, and like, there's just like lots of things about Amazon warehouses that are just like super unhumane mm-hmm. and things like that. So, no, I think I think Bezos is like the classic billionaire titan, like inhumane egomaniac like I'm not a huge fan well of he's basically though. like a, like like if you gave Trump an extra couple hundred billion <laughs> you, they basically could be blood brothers well I think I think he's much more confident Bezos I think is a more confident person <laughs> so, hard to argue yeah that. he's very hard smart. to argue I, th- that. I think Bezos is very smart I mean I think like you know and like maybe you could start saying like the Washington Post stuff maybe he's trying to get into journalism and could make be. it better but I still don't see any evidence that he's doing anything outside of just I'm trying to be the freaking richest best businessman ever um, so, yeah. you remember Larry Ellison? Yeah, yeah, uh, Oracle or something. So before right? the run up, let's go like uh, let's go early two thousands or even uh, ninety eight, ninety nine. When I was paying attention to the Forbes five hundred, Forbes one hundred, all that stuff, I always thought that Ellison was kind of like that rogue billionaire. It really didn't give a shit about anybody else, and you know, I'll I'll spend my money the way I want, and fuck you. Mm-hmm. That was kind of how. Well, I think Ellison has now been superseded. By the same attitude by this guy, I, I think see. he's this. I think he's Ellison Part Two. Yeah, as far as not, I mean, yep. on a much bigger scale. Totally. 
Um, yeah, you know? do you know about this bridge? And and I, I did. I finally saw it yesterday. He built a super yacht. Was it Norway? Uh, it's in the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah and, and I guess to yeah. get now. Let me ask you a question. All that money, right? You didn't think about this problem before you had the yacht built at that location. Yeah. Honestly? Yeah. I mean, maybe he just thought it. So, like, to be fair to the bridge thing, um, it is not like a, a working bridge. It's like a kind of it, like... That doesn't matter, it's, right. though. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a historic kind of monument um, right. to the people in that neighborhood. Right. And it is in need of some restoration. Yeah. And so part of disassembling it to let the yacht through and going back is that they have to pay for this restoration. Mm -hmm. So probably in Bezos's mind, he's like, oh, this will be really great. I will like restore this national monument. Like I'm going to have to pay a ton of money to like make this. So, you know, in these people's minds who are so detached from like the everyday reality on the ground to him, it probably sounded like he was doing like a service to the people of the Netherlands. Like, yeah, this old, like 200 year old bridge. I'll like fix it up whenever I put past my yacht through. But like, he didn't stop to think like, what are the optics of like Perception. you just single-handedly in another country deciding that their historical landmarks can just be disintegrated so that you can pass with your toys. <laughs> like, you arrogant bastard. Exactly. That's how they're viewing yeah, him. Totally. Yeah, the optics was wrong from the beginning. But it goes to being not tied to mankind's reality. Yeah, yeah. these people live just in completely do, different. Hey, this makes more sense. We're going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to do this. You're going to tell a government you're going to do that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. It's 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 so funny. The 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 bil the billionaires, the millionaires and billionaires from the '80s moving into the '90s and moving into the 2000s. It's kind of that that club. There's still some folks still in it, but it's kind of changed a lot, and the scope of power has certainly changed with yeah. those people. I think we're basically back at the Gilded Age of the early 1900s with your like Rockefellers and like Carnegie's. where like J.P. Morgan has to like yeah. finance a war for an entire country with his vast amount of wealth. Like, you know, we're at, we're at, we're at a very similar distribution of wealth mm -hmm. in terms of like the income brackets mm -hmm. um, as we were back in the early 1900s, and I think with that has just come a very similar sort of outlook about like what is possible in the world what forces do i have to push against if i'm going to do something and what responsibilities do i have i mean like at least carnegie writes like the gospel of wealth and like mm -hmm. actually like is like nope now that i'm rich i have a really big responsibility yeah. and like you know and well there's a there was a true philanthropic mindset there yeah Whereas, yeah, we yeah, maybe under critical examination, we would find that out of Musk and those folks. I, I don't may, maybe, but the argument can certainly be made. It's 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 a game to them now. Yeah, and and I mean, like you know, even if you give away a billion dollars a year, if you're worth two hundred billion dollars, like I'm probably like that's a billion dollar one two hundredth. I'm probably worth like twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> so that's like me giving away a hundred dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. are you really going to like pat me on the back if I give away $100 per year whenever I am like able to live this insane? And like even $100 to me is even less than a billion dollars to Bezos. Not because of Got like it. the quantity, the order of magnitude, but because when your needs are already entirely met. Yeah, I like get it. An extra $100 for me is can like actually like is a game changer have a meaning i could have like a meaningful dinner absolutely. with my wife that like helps that changes our relationship you know what i mean right. like but to him like a going from 199 billion to 200 billion dollars like change a there's thing. nothing that would affect him in any no, sort of way no and so that's why it's just kind of like you know i mean i understand this intuition about like you know oh why are we tax like when elon musk complains about taxes and stuff and it's like oh you don't tax like people who are trying to like make things and build things and blah blah, blah but it's just kind of like it's not about that it's about that like you know so you only need so much from society and i know mm -hmm. that you could say like oh no, different people live off different amounts it's like okay make that super high make that like a hundred million dollars <laughs> like it's still like the scope of how much of humanity's resources are being channeled yes. into these individuals 
Yes. That is a problem. And however you want to solve that problem, whether it's through taxation or some other form of economy or some other form of allocation of resources, right. I don't care. But it's clearly an issue, right? Yeah. I, I have you um uh, a, a friend of mine who comes on, uh, Dr. Ruben Brock. He teaches at California University. Fantastic guy. Um, he, the first time he was on the show, Coop, he talked about – uh, his idea that um, if he had that wealth, if he had a, maybe even a fraction of, let's say, Bezos' wealth, he would pick a problem in society that he actually has so much wealth that he could solve. Like, if Jeff Bezos, if he decided that he was going to cure and wipe out hunger in Chicago and the Chicago metro area for the next 20 years. But he could put a plan in place, put enough infrastructure in there, hire the right people, create the nonprofit. He could do it and probably not even glance at it. So Dr. Brock would say, I would find things in society that I could leave. It isn't about my legacy, but I could solve a problem because of this extra wealth. He goes, it really isn't a hard concept. But it doesn't really happen. No, yeah. They're given trinkets, you see, like they're making them. It's more about a visual than it is about impact. Yeah, and it's about being able to do it indefinitely. Um, but even if you gave a twenty-year window, it's successful. Uh, yeah, but like think about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Like you know mm-hmm. that that foundation, if you've ever looked at their ten ninety-nine, it's public. It's a public. You know, mm-hmm. it's a five one c three. I mean, they have like something like fifty billion dollars in assets or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, some of these problems like food on the continent of Africa for 10 years might cost like $50 billion. Um, and, um, but like Bill Gates doesn't want to give all that away. And then he doesn't have a foundation. He wants this thing to live on for 10,000 years. And so they're only going to give away the interest on the capital that is sitting. And so like, it's just, it's about, it is it, there is a bit of egoism i mean on the one hand you could say like you know that impact is smaller but it's spread out over a longer time but on the other hand it's like honestly like i think it's just about wanting to like exist forever you know like it's a legacy it is yeah, yeah. I, I mean i mean, I, I always thought dr brock's point with house go go solve a problem yeah i like that you have that extra wealth sitting there it's you'll never you're never going to spend it it comes a game of just watching the numbers roll up you yeah. know you're hoarding money it's kind of how his point was. Yeah. Just go solve a problem. And that's where I, I do credit Musk over other billionaires is because I think he, in his work, in his like thing that's making him rich, is solving a problem. Yeah. Right. And whereas I don't think that Facebook is solving a problem right. like that I want to be solved. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't. The word problem is right. I'm not really sure. It's <laughs> right. Like it, Facebook, Amazon, like they are solving some business type problem, but they're also creating as many problems, not more than they're solving. Whereas like Tesla... Yeah. You might be able to say some things about creating some problems, yeah. but like it's really like I think people underestimate how difficult it is to get off of fossil fuels and like it's Well Musk doesn't do easy stuff. No. Yeah. It's it's definitely yeah, impressive. And there's been some other companies that have popped up too, um, because of Tesla, like Lucid and some other electric car companies. Yeah, or, Rivian and Yeah, I mean like so that. Yeah. that that they would not be here had he not pioneered that. I definitely think that, you know, Rivian was able to raise enough capital that they like are worth more than Ford or something like that. That's crazy. You know I mean? And like the the reason was was because of Tesla. That like sure. people saw that shoot up, and that actually I think is justified in it shooting up because they're actually like quarter over quarter like selling vehicles. They have all sorts of new vehicles that are coming out in Europe and China and things mm-hmm. like that. So I think there's some like. And, and they're innovating the whole energy sector, like not just cars, but like your car, it can be a backup battery for your right. house. And right. so it's like... Well, Tesla has the roofing shingles now, they, right? They got the Tesla roof, but the Tesla power wall, like they're like a distributed energy solutions company that is like has... But, but like Rivian was just like trying to make a pickup truck. But because people saw this model of Tesla, they were like, you're in the same sort of camp of these people. Like, we're going to, I want to, I want to be on that gravy train. Yeah, so I get it. That allows them to get the capital, which allows them to innovate, which allows them to actually be successful. Wow. So. Did you have fun? Yeah, definitely. I can't thank you enough for doing this. It's fun. Yeah, I like coming out. I love chatting. I love your space. Thank you. Know, you. I love yeah, the vibes. Yeah, I, I was just telling you off camera, I, I announced it last show, we're going to be moving the studio to just a slightly bigger suite. 
I'm really excited about it. It's a lot of work. My electrician's looking at me like, "You gotta be kidding me! <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna move this." I go, "Yeah, we're gonna and we're gonna try to make it look just like this in nice. the new spot." But by the next time, next time you're on, you'll probably, you'll probably be one of the first shows at the new studio. The way the timing is gonna work out. But yeah, you know how to find me. I appreciate it, Coop. Thank Sounds you so good. much, man. Absolutely. All right, all right, friends. See ya. Thank you, and we're out.